morning and welcome to Kaufman's Monthly Entrepreneurship Issues Forum. My name is Anna Pichenina and I am a program officer focusing on research translation work at the Kaufman Foundation. It is my pleasure to share with you today that we are co-organizing this event with Dr. Rayshawn Ray of the Brookings Institution. And our topic this morning is from incarceration to entrepreneurship for returning citizens, current landscape and policy considerations. We host this forum to provide a platform for an in-depth discussion on how to solve problems, and the Kaufman Foundation does not take a political or legislative position in these discussions. Our speakers today come from diverse backgrounds in research, policy, and nonprofit sector. They will cover a broad spectrum of research and policy questions and share personal journeys with us on how current landscape shapes individual experiences. I would like to thank each of today's participants for taking the time out of your very busy days to share your insights. And with that, I will turn it over to our cool organizer, Dr. Rashan Ray, to frame today's discussion for us. Rashan. Anya, thank you so much. I'm so excited about this conversation and this particular event today. I wanna to thank you. I wanna thank your colleagues at the Kaufman Foundation. You all are doing some amazing work and we've been able to assemble some of the best uh, minds in, uh, on this topic, not just scholars, but practitioners, and then also returning citizens themselves who have been able to be empowered to start their own businesses, transform their lives, and also transform their communities. Part of what we know is that roughly, uh, roughly 10 million Americans have criminal records and roughly 75% are reincarcerated uh, within the first five years upon their release, largely because they struggle to find employment. Only about half of returning citizens report um, any income in the first year after the release, and those who did report earning uh, under $15,000 a year. Only 20% earn more than that. These low wages, their inability to get jobs. We also know that not only is having a criminal record a barrier, but also race is a barrier. And the work by sociologist Diva Pager oftentimes highlights the way that race might actually trump a prison record, um, even though we know that a prison record prevents many people from having uh, the opportunities that they should have to get a second shot at life. We know that there has been recent bipartisan support at the federal level, but also at the state level, centering around criminal justice reforms to give people second chances. And honestly, for a lot of people, giving them a first chance in the, in the ability to reduce recidivism to reintegrate back into society, to do the sort of things that are important uh, for them to be able to flourish in the United States of America. So I'm just excited and delighted to be part of this particular very, very important event. One of the things that we know is that people are gonna be able to tackle some very, very important questions, such as what do we know about the effect of formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs on the economy? It's a very, very important question, particularly as we think about this moment during COVID and dealing with some of the issues we're dealing with. We also wanna know why do returning citizens start businesses and what does it mean for their communities? One thing that we'll hear is that a lot of them were simply trying to find employment and were blocked and ended up seeking entrepreneurship as a way to make a living. And then finally, what are some of the policy priorities and interventions for entrepreneurship support for formerly incarcerated individuals? And part of this is setting it up for not only thinking about the policies that should be made at the federal level, but also the state and local levels to be able to empower returning citizens to reintegrate back into society to find work and also reduce recidivism. If you are on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever new platform people are using these days, we have a hashtag for this event called Prisons to Business. So feel free to use that hashtag. Be sure to include the Coffin Foundation. If you have questions, of course, you can drop them here. But if you have them, you can uh, chime in on social media. And we are always excited to be able to engage with people in that format. As we transition, I want to introduce our moderator for the first panel. This panel is going to be powerful. I'm really, really excited about this panel, like I am all three of them. It's my pleasure to introduce Kylie Wong, who is a PhD candidate in the Columbia School of Business, who will be moderating this event and will introduce our panelists for the first session. Kylie, thank you. Thank you, Rayshawn. Um, thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Kylie Huang, a PhD candidate at Columbia Business School, and I'll be moderating our first panel session today on what we know about the effect of formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs on the economy. 
I'm honored to be the moderator today as my dissertation, which has actually been funded by the Kauffman Foundation, also focuses on how formerly incarcerated people engage in entrepreneurship as a way to overcome labor market discrimination. So we're all super excited to hear from our three incredible speakers today uh, who are doing seminal work around the topics of crime, incarceration, re-entry, and racial inequality. So our speakers today are Dr. Keisha Middlemass, Associate Professor of the Department of Political Science at Howard University, then Dr. Michael Stoll, Professor of Public Policy at University of California, Los Angeles, and then Dr. Christopher Eugen, Regents Professor and Martindale Chair in Sociology, Law, and Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. So we'll be hearing from our three speakers first, and then we'll be opening up to a discussion among the panelists for questions and answers. So now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Keisha Middlemass at Howard University. Dr. Middlemass has been working on research focusing on the policies around prisoner reentry and has also recently written an award-winning book, Convicted and Condemned, the Politics and Policies of Prisoner Reentry. So now Dr. Keisha Middlemass, over to you. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and then get started. So today, as Kylie mentioned, I will be drawing from my work, uh, largely from Convicted and Condemned, but also my work since the publication of this book. And really just going to give you an overview. A lot of this will be setting the stage for the later conversations today. So understanding re-entry, I think of a felony conviction and those that are re-entering as this idea of being socially disabled, as being disabled in the sense of public policies restricting individuals. And the challenges of re-entry is that state and federal policies are not coordinated. There's no department of re-entry, which means that oftentimes these policies are passed in a political framework that uh, really does worsen racial uh, disparities and inequities. And a lot of individuals, unfortunately, remain in poverty, which is why this program today is so important is because I believe entrepreneurship can get around some of these restrictions. There's lots of intersectional consequences around race and gender. So the idea that when women are incarcerated, their children go into foster care. And so when we think about employment and re-entry and those larger big questions, we really have to go back to the Sentencing Reform Act, 1984. It has been expanded on and what have you, but it really did expand employment screening tools like criminal background checks, uh, the, the use of and the requirement of occupational licenses and certificates. But we also saw then this expansion outside of government, outside of law enforcement, the private and public organizations using these screening tools to make sure individuals cannot actually become legally employed. Through the Sentencing Reform Act and then later on in the 1990s, Congress funded the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. This was previously accessible only by law enforcement. But since 9-11, that uh, criminal background check system has expanded beyond just um, gun purchases. And in fact, in multiple venues, a lot of people think it is now literally a national criminal data uh, or records database because arrests are in there. It's not just convictions. And that really hearkens to the 10 million plus people that Dr. Ray mentioned in his introduction. So re-entering is really based on these multiple policies and I've only touched upon a couple of them, but it's really an individual's responsibility, unfortunately. But there's no one way to re-enter. There are multiple ways to re-enter. However, my argument is that without some form of public accommodations or curb ramps, so we help individuals that are physically disabled get around, we as a society through the Americans with Disabilities Act has actually changed and transformed how individuals that are physically unable to walk upstairs are able to access um, certain spaces. 
And my argument is really that we should, as a society, transform the public policies because re-entering adults make up a growing share of the population. So when we start thinking about this broader idea of contradictions and denying individuals the right to employment, it contradicts notions of rehabilitation and reintegration, but more importantly is figuring out these workarounds. It's gonna take a tremendous amount of energy, political capital, and just plain common sense, which we don't always see in politics to fix and change these laws. So I believe that entrepreneurship is the workaround with some of these public policies. And I'm happy to take your questions and talk more about re-entry um, in the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your inspiring talk. And uh, next we'll be hearing from Dr. Michael Stoll at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Ms. Dr. Stoll has groundbreaking research about crime, incarceration, and employment, really highlighting the labor market consequences of mass incarceration and employer discrimination. His research has been featured in both academic journals and media outlets, and he has several books on reentry and the prison system in the United States. So Dr. Stoll, whenever you're ready. I am. Thank you for having me. And uh, good morning to everybody from the West Coast. So I, I wanted to take this opportunity in my opening remarks just to make uh, three general points and, and then um, give a little detail uh, about the three points. And then uh, I'd be welcome to uh, have more discussion on these in the Q&A part of the program. And thanks to everybody for organizing in this forum. And thanks to Dr. Wong for your important contributions that you were making with your dis dissertation and especially uh, Dr. Rachel Ray for, for organizing this panel. So the three general points that I wanna make are first that as Dr. Ray pointed out at the beginning, that the experiences of, uh, of ex-offenders in the labor market uh, have been uh, troublesome for a variety of reasons and costly to society. As he notes that in the first year, only about 50% uh, uh, receive employment. There's a high degree of recidivism that's costly to the state um, and, and to uh, taxpayers for all the reasons that, that, that we know. Um, there's a whole host of research on why uh, ex-offenders have uh, uh, limited success in the labor market post, post entry. And that has to do with employer will, unwillingness to hire them for a variety of reasons, including fearfulness of harming uh, customers or em employees. Uh, fear of being sued for negligent hiring lawsuits, and also fear of, as, as Dr. Rachel Ray uh, talked about, as, as using ex-offenders um, and, and race as proxies for something um, that employers also are, are, are leery about unfoundedly so. And so what that means is that there's a tremendous opportunity to, uh, to have intervention for ex-offenders in, in the labor market, and entrepreneurship programs are certainly one avenue through which we should be exploring. Um, oh, and so the second point I'm going to make is that um, that the entrepreneurial programs for ex-offenders show some promise, but that the research and evaluation that are done are are not experimental designs, and so we don't have good confidence on um, on the on the net impact of these entrepreneurial programs. Again, they show a tremendous amount of promise. And so we wanna demonstrate that in a, a controlled environment that the, that the outcomes that we're observing from these non-experimental programs uh, persist. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. And the third is that uh, there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in federal and state workforce development programs to include more workforce development training around entrepreneurship issues. With the new Biden administration coming into play, we know that funds around workforce development will be increasing with the potential for the new infrastructure bill, which will come up potentially after the COVID relief bill is discussed. There will be tremendous opportunities for uh, workforce development programs to, to, to train workers. But one thing that they have not done well is train uh, ex-offenders and entrepreneurial programs. And, and, and we think that there's a, an opportunity for that to happen, in particular, 
uh, the ability to train uh, entrepreneurial programs and to be able to link successful graduates of those programs into businesses and with contracts with the federal government for uh, new infrastructure work that's likely to come out of the uh, out of the federal spending the next year or two. So let me just um, expand on points two and three. So there is good um, good evidence on on promise of entrepreneurial programs for, for those either in prison or out of prison. And the success of those programs seems to be in part whether or not they're in prison entrepreneurial programs versus out of prison entrepreneurial programs. In prison entrepreneurial programs seem to have very high retention rates in part because uh, those in prison are, are, are expected and in some cases uh, mandated by states to, to take these classes. Um, and but the quality of the instruction matters too. where there is instruction that mimics sort of many MBA programs, those programs seem to be much more successful than programs that uh, teach in just the basic business skills of accounting and marketing, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So, the, so we know that in the out of prison programs, one of the key concerns is uh, attrition. Most of these programs are, are voluntary. Uh, that the retention rates are, are fairly low over time. And part of the reason for that is that there's a significant amount of barriers to participation for, for people who are attending these programs. There are barriers such as um, um, uh, family issues, uh, transportation costs, childcare uh, issues, conflicts with work, uh, work, work schedules, as well as uh, in some cases, parole restrictions. And so, you know, attrition on these uh, voluntary programs is something that I think we have to pay uh, a good attention to. Still, um, for those programs that have shown success, um, um, that the outcomes are fairly good. In one very good non-experimental study of the prison entrepreneurial program in Texas by the Institute for a Competitive Inner City, what they've demonstrated is that the uh, retention rates for in prison entrepreneurial programs were high, instruction was high quality. And what you saw was demonst demonstrable positive outcomes on both individuals who took the program as well as the Texas state economy. For individuals who successfully completed the program compared to uh, a typical ex-offender in Texas, what you see is higher rates of employment, higher rates of business ownership, higher rates of home ownership and, and higher rates of savings accumulation for those who participated in the PEP program, Prison Entrepreneurial Program, than comparable ex-offenders um, in the state uh, who, who, who did not. So that's, uh, that's fairly good. Um, still, um, you know, compared to ex-offenders, the typical ex-offenders might not be the right comparison uh, because as we know, uh, small businesses of which uh, most entrepreneurial uh, uh, participants go into um, have a high degree of instability. Uh, business foreclosure rates or uh, closure rates are pretty high. They're usually undercapitalized. And this is particularly true for, uh, for Black small businesses. And so we would want to worry about the experiences of, of, of Black sex offender entrepreneurs because they're going to suffer from all the uh, potential barriers to entry in small business market that, 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 that Black business people um, e experience. Still, uh, what we did uh, observe is, is, is pretty large positive impacts on the Texas state economy. Um, mm -hmm. For each business that was started by a graduate of the prison education uh, entrepreneurship program, uh, three additional jobs were created. And um, there was a multiplier effect of, of five for the revenue generation from, from these programs. So, um, and uh, these programs were successful in a few key areas that are, I think would be fairly obvious. They were in uh, transportation, uh, uh, facility services, uh, construction, um, security services, uh, and, and, and retail trade. But again, um, you know, what we don't know for sure is whether or not these impacts are real. And that's because these programs are voluntary for the prison entrepreneurial program volunteers signed up um, to be part of the program and those usually are highly motivated with a certain set of skills. Uh, and then based on application, the administrators of the program then selected who they thought would be the best match for the program. 
So there's a high degree of selectivity. And so one wants to know whether or not, even in the absence of this prison entrepreneur program, those ex offenders uh, would have gone on and done well anyway. And so we do need more good experimental evaluation where we have a treatment group that we could uh, ob observe uh, impacts compared to not only like ex offenders, but also others in the society who look just like ex offenders, but don't have a criminal criminal record. And so my, my, my final point though, is that because of the promise shown by um, entrepreneurial programs for ex offenders, that there's a, a, a high degree of opportunity, I think in the next round of thinking about and funding workforce development activities in both the federal and the state uh, level. As I, as I mentioned with the new Biden administration, there'll be increased attention to uh, a, a worker outcome improvement. And one of the ways that we do that is through workforce development. Uh, but the literature on workforce development shows that uh, the, the impacts on ex-offenders that go through the program are small to, to negligible. And the reason I think it is, is that we haven't really thought hard about how best to use the skill set of ex-offenders. We assume that they have limited skills, but I think that's the wrong assumption. I think they have skills that we have not yet identified that, uh, that could be matched well for things like entrepreneurship. There's a certain set of skills that people have um, in, um, that, that we just don't have a good way of measuring. It might be on hustle, it might be on, on, on networking. There's a lot of skills that ex-offenders have that have developed over time for survival that I think we need to be able to identify, train up and, and, um, and use to the benefit. With that though, I think there, uh, that, that with PEP, with this kind of investment in workforce training and thinking creatively about new entrepreneurial type programs in the next round of workforce development, that, uh, that we will see positive returns, not only um, on, the, on, on the local and state economies, but also on return of investment to uh, society's daughters, dollars for investing in those kind of programs. The PEP, for example, in Texas showed a return on investment of almost 384% over a five-year period. In one year alone, the cost of the program was about $7,500, uh, but the return on savings to federal and state from, uh, from less recidivism, from less use of SNAP dollars, et cetera, was about $12,500. So in one year alone, you paid back the program. Now, PEP was funded by, 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 by private funds. Still, even if the state were to invest that $7,500 per per participant, the state will get back that money in less than one year. So I think there's a great opportunity for us to think more creatively about entrepreneur programs. I look forward to speaking more about that at the end of this program. Thanks again for the opportunity to, to, to listen to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Still. Um, now, finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Christopher Eugen at University of Minnesota was renowned for his work on crime, law, and inequality, especially coming from a life course perspective. So his seminal work has been published in many academic journals and multiple books, and it has really helped us understand the long-term impacts of crime and the public policies around mass incarceration in the United States. So please, Dr. Eugen, whenever you're ready. Thank you, uh, Kylie. This is a real, a real treat. Um, I, I'm a professor, but I was a social worker uh, before before this period and um, did employment and training assistance for people leaving jails and prisons. Um, I've written, as, as Kylie mentioned, on, on work and crime. I've also been a small business owner and entrepreneur for the last 10 years. And I'm somebody who had a juvenile, uh, 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 a lot of a, a exposure in the juvenile justice system, but not the adult criminal justice system, which makes a big difference in the sort of discrimination that you might face in housing, employment, et cetera. Um, I'll just make, um, we, we at professors like to make three key points. So I'll make three key points as well. Um, and, and say first, let uh, my baseline assumption in terms of the effects on the economy um, is, uh, is for, first I'll say that, that Kylie and Professor Stahl have done some of the very best work in this area. So these are the real experts who I've learned from. Um, that, that, but let, let me start first, the, the, the assumption for me is always that formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs will have similar to eff effects to other entrepreneurs in terms of the impact on the economy. And so by that, I mean, there's nothing um, uh, 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 particularly 
uh, uh, different. Um, and just like, you know, we don't, we don't assume that immigrant entrepreneurs are going to have lesser effect or, or any different effect than other entrepreneurs. Instead, they contribute to the dynamism, the job creation, uh, uh, and, and the opportunities in the U.S. economy. Now, there is reason to expect a few differences, though, I mean, theoretically, um, but, but also from observation. That is that people with records often help create opportunities for other people with records. That is, they, they are able to discern uh, uh, who might be a good employee, and they're able to uh, 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 bring those, those folks on board to their businesses. Um, now, second, uh, I, I would say that that uh, people with records clearly face great employment discrimination. I won't dwell on this, um, except to note that uh, uh, the the uh, uh, depending on how deep one goes into the system, the, that that discrimination extends. But even in I, I did an experiment in which we just had people who had a, a three year old disorderly conduct arrest um, uh, with no conviction, just that arrest record. And we found, found effects for that record as well as race. And so uh, for black applicants with a record, with just an arrest record, it reduced their callback rate from employers from 38 to 34 percent or from 28 percent to 24 percent. For, for white applicants, it reduced it from 38 to 34. So there's clearly a, a racial discrimination employment for, for otherwise identical applicants. And there's clearly discrimination on the basis of prison records. But also, you know, for um, uh, uh, we, ha we have to think about people with felony level records as well as people who've been to prison. And that gets us up to around 20 million rather than 10 million. Um, now, now the, the other piece of that discrimination puzzle is collateral sanctions pile on. So you can't just look at employment discrimination in isolation uh, because a criminal record can stop you from getting into college. It can stop you from getting an occupational license. So, so this is this is a deep uh, uh, problem and question. And the United States is unusual in the degree of of continuing punishment that we apply to people uh, uh, internationally. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the way it is in the United States. Third, I, I'd say that many people inside express great interests in self-employment and entrepreneurship, and and find it attractive. Um, as 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 Michael. Had, had mentioned that there's uh, uh, that one of the key questions is skill transfer. That's something people on the inside are well aware of. That how do I use the the skills that I that I might have in sales or distribution um, or or uh, uh, of products of of, uh, uh, of of that how can how can I generalize this this expertise or even you know computer security um, uh, other other forms of security. Uh, these, in, in some cases, there's there's general skills. I, I would say that you know one question that a lot of us have had over the years is: Is there an entrepreneurial personality? Are there are there uh, uh, folks who do better working for themselves than for others? And I, I've certainly spoken with several people on the inside who who are this way. Just like with professors, there's professors enjoy having a great degree of autonomy in our life. We value that above other val other values. Um, it, it very well could be that uh, that folks inside have a greater preference. Um, I've certainly spoken with many who've said, you know, I can work, uh, 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 I'll work 60 hours a week for myself, um, and I'm willing to start at the bottom, but it's much more difficult uh, uh, for me to do that within the structure, a, a rigid uh, hierarchical authority structure in an organization. Um, now, sometimes, uh, uh, frankly, that these entrepreneurial dreams are, are, un, are not immediately realistic. I don't want to say they're unrealistic, but you, certainly many, if you ask what they want to do, I want to run a record company. Um, well, that, that is a difficult uh, uh, thing to attain, and it's a very crowded field. Um, and so, so there, there, I've certainly been in, in prisons, in Halden Prison in Norway, there's a recording studio, and people do get training in this area. Um, in many places around the United States, you can get mentoring and, and uh, uh, leads here. But I, but I do have to say, sometimes there's a match, a question of matching between the, the economic demand and the, the form of entrepreneurship. But I'll say, you know, I'll just give a, a few success stories that I know are often based on, on, on relatively low capital 
um, investment um, because it's difficult to, to, to attain that investment early on, uh, but have a high growth tra tra trajectory. And so often these are services provided to businesses um, which might be might involve cleaning, might involve uh, uh, providing plants. Um, I've even seen some doing corporate art to law firms. Um, uh, that that I, I can I can tell you I, I personally know individuals who be, who got out of prison with nothing more than a five gallon bucket, a bottle of ammonia, and a squeegee, and within a year had uh, two trucks and four employees uh, with a. a corporate window cleaning service. Um, other things, demolition work, auto detailing, um, painting, et cetera. But I, this brings to mind a few, dis a few barriers that still exist and one is credit. Um, so, so if you are, if you are uh, uh, working as, a, as uh, in construction or working in, in painting, et cetera, you, you often need access to credit. This can be difficult. Um, uh, folks might not realize that, you know, if you go to prison, um, you might leave a lease that is going to be unpaid, and this is this is going to uh, create a, a, a big pile of debt. Um, the, you're also locked out of many industries. Um, it's very difficult to do child care, for example, if you have a, a criminal record. It's very difficult to open your own home health care uh, facility. You might be ineligible for certain federal programs like uh, PPP. Um, although I know so, so the Biden administration is, is working on this right now. Um, so these are these are all challenges. A few opportunities on the horizon. Um, uh, in my view, a little a little support and cushion can make a big difference. Um, that uh, uh, some programs uh, that provide employment are also working on entrepreneurship on the outside. That the All Square program in Minneapolis is an example of that. Um, and, and the, the, to my knowledge, there aren't real set asides for people with records, but, uh, but that's also a possibility. I, I think businesses, you know, many businesses tend to fail early. And so providing some sort of support and lifelines um, uh, uh, when folks run into a, a credit squeeze or a recession can really uh, help them get, to get through the hump, get over that, that period. Um, I, I want to close. I know I'm, I'm coming up on time, so I'll close by thanking the, the Kauffman Foundation. I'm really eager to learn from you all, um, but let me just emphasize that uh, uh, those three points that, that prison entrepreneurs are, are entrepreneurs just like any other. Um, they face uh, greater discrimination than, than, than these other uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and there are plenty of uh, motivation and plenty of great models out there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Egan. Um, so now I'd like to open up to question and answers, and I'd like to invite uh, the audience to write out any questions that you might want to ask our panel speakers, and I'll read them out for you. Um, so I thought we could start out with the question of, um, which has come up from the audience, and also I think uh, Dr. Yugen did mention a bit about it, but maybe we could start speaking about the barriers to entrepreneurship that formerly incarcerated people will have to face. So they face barriers not only to employment and housing and others, but probably also have barriers into entrepreneurship. So I thought it would be nice to kind of talk about that and maybe perhaps think of ways that policy or uh, public policies can address these um, barriers to entrepreneurship. I, I'll just say one thing that's relatively open in the United States relative to other nations is there are fewer barriers to starting a business in the United States than, than elsewhere. So that that is one one opportunity. But the 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 ones I mentioned were 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 really about capital and um, uh, uh, this the state the the record itself preventing uh, participation in some in some industries. But I know I know my colleagues here know know quite a bit more than I do about. The one, the one barrier uh, that I think will be important, uh, especially in light of the potential for increased dollars from the federal government for infrastructure development, is the limit on uh, federal and state contracts for some businesses for owners that have a criminal felony conviction. Um, um, the uh, states differ. It's murky. The federal government um, 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 uh, can rule on that in various ways, but I think uh, my reading is it uh, of it is that uh, that 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 record is not unseen, 
and that in certain instances it could be used against a, 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 a contractor trying to uh, attain federal contracts uh, depending on the nature of the criminal conviction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, one, one huge barrier I think that needs to be addressed in a very serious way is how we rationalize thinking about uh, limiting uh, state and federal contracts for those businesses owned by people with felony records. A, a lot of contracts also um, do carve outs and enumerate very specific crimes. And we've got this false dichotomy between nonviolent and violent crimes that really does restrict people in being able to access contracts. And you also see that at the individual level in terms of work, but also in the nonprofit organizations trying to train people in order to actually apply for contracts. And I think that's a really important point that needs to be addressed in a federal law, but also then um, state laws and, and think about the discrimination that takes place because of these carve outs. Thank you. Um, I thought next we could talk about how um, there is some federal training or inside and also outside of prisons for formerly incarcerated people who are interested in entrepreneurship. And I thought we could kind of speak about what types of training there are out there and also how that could be improved and how sometimes that may be uh, problematic sometimes and that some of you mentioned that sometimes the entrepreneurial ideas that uh, formerly incarcerated people think about are not readily uh, realistic. So we could kind of talk, touch upon that. I guess I, I'd just add that I, more, more generally the, that the, the social networks of individuals inside are often pretty constrained. And so having more exchange with the community in general makes a big difference. And, and, so, and, and so some of this, in a way, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, that entrepreneurship uh, uh, can arise through programs and it can also arise organically through our social connections and opportunities. Um, and and so, so one of the things that I, I see prisons as kind of uh, like network deserts in, in, in some often. Um, and, and so that uh, facilitating the flow of volunteers, of, of folks. Um, I, know, I know people, um, for example, the, some of the success stories, they, they met through prison choirs or they met through 12-step uh, 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 programs or they met through uh, uh, church. They met through, through uh, uh, each of these things can provide opportunities that can help you get your business off the ground. Um, so, so those, so that's one of the the. Uh, uh, it's not directly answering the question in terms of structuring these opportunities, but I'm, but that flow and exchange, I think, is is a, is a key piece of it. And and I think this flow and exchange can actually be facilitated by universities. And I'll put a link in the um, chat. But the P2P is, is prisons to PhD program. Universities can create chapters on campus, student, student run chapters. They just need a faculty advisor. And that would be a way to help individuals that are returning connect with a network of universities. And I'm talking about not just, you know, traditional universities, but community colleges, liberal arts colleges. It's not just the inside out programs that are taking courses in, but it's making sure that individuals that are, are then returning have volunteers that will help them navigate um, different aspects of, of society. And, and it's also helpful to have young people be integrated into re-entry help because they then are the ones that will be in these organizations and making decisions and being policy analysts in the future. I want to add, uh, I want to make um, two points this time instead of three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, first, the first point is that I wanted to add to the previous question answer that one area for uh, barriers that we should examine is the barriers to credit markets. And Professor Ugin was right that that was one of the biggest sticking points in uh, mm -hmm. for uh, uh, startup success of these uh, small businesses is access to credit markets. And that's all the more important for black ex-offenders where uh, you know black entrepreneurs already have difficulty accessing credit because of issues around race. 
uh, and then to add on to that record uh, is 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 uh, even more problematic. So understanding the the the, the nature, uh, the extent, the magnitude, the ways that that credit markets limit ex-offender entrepreneurs' ability to get the credit they need, uh, given a, a a sound demonstrable plan, is something I think we need to know. The second point I think too, with regard to this question about with work versus development, I can't emphasize enough, and maybe the Kaufman Foundation could put this on their radar screen, is that having good evaluation evidence on the effectiveness of these programs as in the, as 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 as, as uh, effective treatment programs for enhancing employment and economic activity for ex offenders uh, cannot be overstated i think pr uh, professor ugin is right like so, there's some people that just have the entrepreneurial spirit and it doesn't matter whether they have an ex offender record or not they're going to go out there and they're going to do their thing and more than likely they're gonna be successful. And so, but that, but, but what we really wanna know is, you know, relative to something else we could do for ex-offenders or nothing at all, do these prison entrepreneur programs or entrepreneur programs for ex-offenders matter? And, uh, and if so, how do they matter? Under what conditions, what kind of training, what kind of support, right? And so having good evidence around that would go a long way to demonstrating to states and the federal government that these are, that these are worthwhile investments. As I said before, um, even you know, with this small program, or not small program, but with this non-experimental evaluation in Texas with PEP, uh, you know that that prison uh, entrepreneurship program costs seventy five hundred dollars, which is a little bit more than what you would find for a typical workforce development program, which costs somewhere between thirty five hundred and five thousand dollars a year. Still, you know, you get your return to society back in a year. Right. In the absence of that, you know, there's going to be high, uh, not only collateral costs to individuals, but collateral costs to society in the form of, 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 of more taxpayer expense for uh, supporting and, and, and otherwise uh, paying for uh, criminal justice expenses uh, for uh, the higher recidivism rates that we see when uh, ex-offenders have, have no programming or support once they uh, return home from prison. Absolutely. Um, so I thought that next we could also speak about, um, I think uh, Professor Yugen mentioned this as well on the, I guess, the additional economic impact of entrepreneurship by formerly incarcerated people and in that they are more likely to help other uh, impacted individuals who have been through the prison system. And I thought we could kind of talk about that and other ways in which uh, entrepreneurship by formerly incarcerated people may have a bit more impact than other entrepreneurship by individuals who haven't been through the prison system. Yeah, well, well one thing, and, and, and Kylie, I think I know from your research, and I hope you'll share it with folks, um, that, that folks do earn a little more money, likely, um, when they are self-employed and, and engaging in entrepreneurship than they would otherwise. Um, and, and, you know, as I'm a criminologist, so I, what I think about partly is um, how we, that, that as a society, we need fewer prisoners and more taxpayers. Um, and, and so that seems really simple, right? But, 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 the, the, uh, uh, but, but providing opportunities, uh, uh, particularly for those facing enormous discrimination, discrimination, as I said, that piles on, not just from employment, but from the community, from, from all sorts of directions, that that, that really can have, a, you know, in my, I, I don't want to use terms like multiplier in a sloppy way when, we're, when there's economists in the house, um, but, but it can multiply and radiate out, ripple outward to affect broader communities. And I, just one example of that would be um, a, a, a young man I, I know who, who uh, uh, had, a, had a manslaughter conviction after um, driving while intoxicated. Um, and, and ended up um, um, not being able to uh, uh, pursue his, his, his chosen career because of licensure. He was able, though, to start a construction company um, and, and uh, uh, continues to work with uh, 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 formerly incarcerated, with people with records, um, and, and has built up a, 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 a large and very successful operation. Um, and, and so you see the, that... that um, Okay, he he has uh, uh, networks and opportunities that um, others that that I might not have access to, 
Uh, he knows people who, who are, are highly motivated, who want to do the work, and he can vouch for, uh, for individuals personally, um, but they can also vouch for, for their peers. And so it, it, it can feed on itself. Can I, can I also make this other important point too? I think that's great, uh, uh, Professor Ugin. I want to keep, keep it formal, although I want to call you Chris, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I, I think it's also important to note that the kind of training that we are talking about is not, is not only uh, entrepreneurship uh, for the private good, but also socially productive entrepreneurship too, because mm -hmm. There are a lot of folks coming out of prison that that not only just want to make some money, but they actually want to help people that were like themselves not get into the path they were in. So programming around starting nonprofits or, or, or developing skills in which uh, their life and experiences matter can 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 go a long way too. For example, uh, in many cities now, uh, a lot of uh, social services are hiring back ex-offenders to do uh, anti-gang work, to do uh, re-entry work, right? I mean, who better that understands the challenges and, and unique circumstances than, than folks who have experienced that? And so I think it's not only about training to make, to, for them to make money and, and, and to, but we can move the economy in different ways too. You know, helping people transition uh, uh, which is both personally and socially satisfying, uh, but also has meaning, I think is something that we should be thinking about too. So training for nonprofit management, for starting and operating nonprofit uh, 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 corporations, figuring out how you apply for nonprofit staff, all that stuff is stuff that we should be thinking about in, in this uh, training efforts as well. And last point I'd like to plug, um, thinking about the ripple effect, and it's not just the dignity of the in individual, but it's the dignity of their family. It's modeling for their children. It's being able to help the entire family. So it's we're not just talking about the individual being able to become an entrepreneur, but the positive impact that can have in the immediate family, but also in the community. And so these these broader conversations are so important because of so many people that could be positively affected. Thank you. This is all really powerful. Um, I think there's a lot of curiosity from the audience about the training programs inside prisons. Um, and I thought it would be nice to kind of talk about how widespread these programs are, whether they're expanding in the United States, and um, I guess how the training programs, uh, how people can be more involved in these training programs as well. I'll let my colleagues, I know there's there's so much variety and it really does, de like it does depend on where an individual is incarcerated. It depends on the, um, actual willingness of an administrator to allow programs to be brought in. And then one of the hard, hard facts is that individuals could be trained in a particular craft, let's say landscaping, um, because we have to remember that when you're incarcerated, individuals that are incarcerated manage the prison. They do HVAC, they do plumbing, they do the landscaping, they learn, they paint, they clean, they do laundry, they cook, they run the prison. But oftentimes when they then re-enter, there's laws that restrict them from getting a job in what they've been trained in. And hence we need these, these broad policies to decouple individual statutes connected to a particular job because the state is funding the individuals to be trained in prison. But then when they re-enter, they're restricted from actually being able to use their training in a, in a, in a way that is satisfying to the individual. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. And I know Professor Stahl has studied these, so I'll, I'll be brief. The, um, I, I, I have to mention COVID here and, and how uh, uh, so much has stopped within prison. I, I mean, my, my work has had to stop. Um, um, many of the educational programs with which I'm involved have have really been compromised. Um, uh, uh, people inside, if you don't know, often don't have great access uh, or freedom to use the internet or to 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 meet the way we are meeting this morning. Um, so so it's that's been a real challenge. I, I will say that it, it also um, 
uh, uh, like, like to uh, uh, support what Professor Middlemass said about localized uh, approaches. Um, one, one that uh, uh, was just mentioned was uh, 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 landscaping, et, et cetera, that, that in, in my, in Minnesota, um, the folks are trying to get an urban forestry program off the ground in part because people can, um, in this labor market, that tree trimming is something that one can start with relatively little capital. One can begin a business and get the, get the necessary skills to do that. That seems to be attractive. Um, um, some that, 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 that uh, I, I, I did want to just mention, there, there are cases in which um, uh, uh, because of all this discrimination that, that folks can be exploited on the labor market and they can, they can work under very unsafe conditions. Um, and so, so the demolition work is one of those areas where I've seen people exposed to toxins um, coming out of prison uh, and, 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 and um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, starting or starting, starting businesses that, that, um, that, that can, that can um, lead, lead, jeopardize their safety, et cetera. So, so I guess I, I just say that with, there, there's some, um, uh, uh, there's, there's many different paths here, but, but you know, there, there's a few guardrails that we have to think about as well. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I would just say to answer the question efficiently is just that the, we just don't have a good accounting for all the types and kinds of, of, of programs that exist. We do know that uh, some states have experimented with them. Uh, they differ in their, in their, in their focus. Uh, there are a lot of emerging private programs uh, you know, in California, for example, there's one on entrepreneurship and technology where Silicon Valley is deeply connected with um, ex-offenders in the state prison system and developing their, their, their coding skills. Uh, so, so we don't have a good accounting for the numbers and the, and the kind and the size. And so I think that would be a good effort. But I think even more important is just understanding um, the program impacts um, so that we have guidance about whether or not investments in these areas from state, local, or federal actors would be worthwhile on a host of dimensions. And I think we need that, we need that evidence. Thank you. Um, I think this might be now our last question. So I wanted to zoom out a bit and um, ask all your opinions on what you think um, we should aim for as our main goal in public policy, both in terms of entrepreneurship and employment for the formerly incarcerated people. I think our main goal is to demonstrate that they are a viable, um, uh, not, not only an alternative, but item on the menu for the types of workforce development training uh, that we should be undertaking uh, for, for, for ex-offenders. As I noted below, uh, it, it, at the beginning of the program, that with the shift in administration, and I'm almost guaranteed additional funding in a whole host of streams, not only workforce development, but in particular, it's likely that we get a huge infrastructure bill, that there's gonna be tremendous amounts of opportunity for ex-offenders to, uh, to be trained in entrepreneurship, particularly in areas where they're already demonstrating much success, like in construction, and linking that to federal and state spending efforts in this regard to, to, to double the impact of the social investment. I would like to echo this idea of investment. And although we've had this moment in time with the social movements of 2020 and trying to really decouple spending from police, if we are really serious about re-entry and helping individuals actually acclimate and be able to work and be able to be entrepreneurs, I would really like to see policy start attacking the public budgets of the criminal justice system where a state on average spends about a billion dollars on the criminal justice system, but thousands of dollars on re-entry. I would love to see our economists and our public budget experts really start interrogating where money is spent so we can shift from the criminal justice system to re-entry and fund some of these fabulous programs that we know save money on the back end. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just add the um, uh, uh, the criminological side of me. Uh, 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 I want to focus on the economic opportunity, but but also the 
the opportunity for, for people inside um, who are not, who don't have a lot of opportunities. And, and I think, you know, we think about prisons as a, as a particular institution, but just think about colleges and higher education for a moment. What does a residential college do for people? They, they don't know exactly what they want to do. They, they need exposure to a, a diversity of experiences and opportunities. Entrepreneurship is, is, uh, is ultimately super important. The, the, the one that, but, but people will grab hold. They need some kind of hook for a change in their life. And, and, and I, many people in prison will take advantage of the opportunities that we provide. If we, you know, if whether that's Toastmasters and they're learning about public speaking or, or it's, it, it's, it's a, a, a mentorship programs or, or it's, it's entrepreneurship, all of these things can help. And, and a subset of those individuals is going to grab hold of those ideas and, and, and really take them and run. And if we can do that on a mass scale, um, we'll dramatically reduce the return to prison. I'm convinced of it. Thank you so much. This has been a really powerful and helpful discussion. I've learned so much. I'm sure the audience has really learned a lot. So um, I'd like to give a round of applause to our three wonderful speakers and I'll pass it on to our next panel speakers. Um, and thank you so much everyone for listening. All right, thank you so much, Kylie and to all our panelists for a great start. Um, my name is Robert Hill and I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, my research is focusing on disadvantaged entrepreneurs and helper organizations of different types. Um, I'm excited about all of our panelists, but also um, getting to meet for the first time Brian Kelly because my research is actually being conducted inside of uh, PEP, the Prison Entrepreneurship Program that has been mentioned before. Um, so I'm excited to address this topic of um, why do returning citizens start businesses and what does it mean for communities? And so that's the broader uh, question that we're looking to address today. And so um, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, one at a time just to present um, a couple of minutes worth of initial remarks and then guide us through some uh, questions and answers uh, time. So I believe we're going through in just alphabetical order. And so up first is uh, Mr. Anthony Belton, who's the head instructor at the Flickshop School of Business. So uh, Anthony, would you mind kicking us off here with your thoughts? Thank you guys for having me on this amazing panel. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed everything that was said. But, um, the professors that spoke on the first panel, everything they said was actually very, very accurate and a lot of barriers that we are definitely going through as returning citizens to be starting a business. Um, me, myself, just to give a, a short intro on myself, I did serve 14 years in prison. I came home and I started a business and I've been running a business since 2005 and it's now 2021. So I consider myself a moderate success story, but I um, definitely have a lot to share in terms of a lot of keynote aspects that were brought upon with, um, with the professor that spoke earlier. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. Um... I guess up next we can go to Mr. Kyle uh, J. Benson Smith, who is the executive director of a uh, director of Determination Incorporated. So, Kyle, thanks for sharing your thoughts today. Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle. I run a small nonprofit here in Kansas City called Determination Incorporated. Our mission is to create a pathway to opportunity for formerly incarcerated people through entrepreneurship. So I really appreciate the professors giving that high level view. Um, I'm just a grassroots dude, just a guy on the ground who goes into prison and asks folks, hey, do you wanna start a business? And if they say yes, then I say, you wanna talk about it? And then we talk about it some. And then eventually once they trust me a little bit, I say, hey, I think when you get home, you'd be better off doing this with help than alone. So just remember that you're never alone when you're starting a business. So I thought it'd be good to share just a little bit. One of the first questions that we actually ask folks whenever they're thinking about starting a business is why do you wanna start a business? You know, we often just explain it as, you have to know your why if you're gonna ride those highs and lows of being a business owner. So this is a question that I've actually had the chance to ask quite a few people. And I wanted to share some of those answers with you. Uh, these are some entrepreneurs. I've learned from all of them. Um, some of them I've worked more closely with and some like Sarah here, 
I've just had the opportunity to really be inspired by. So Sarah Montine is a local business owner here in Kansas City who owns All American Cleaning Company. Um, I bolded so I don't have to read at you guys the whole thing every time, but she shared, she started her business when she got out of prison because she just couldn't get ahead. I did not feel due to my background and time wasted not going to school because of incarceration that getting a decent salary paying job was realistic. So that's something that I think the professors touched upon. Um, climbing the job ladder isn't gonna get you to a job that pays very much, but the workaround of entrepreneurship and creating your own job and then creating jobs for others is maybe a path to more economic opportunity. Sarah is actually an example. Uh, I think her business has been around for almost a decade or so. She's had the chance to hire formerly incarcerated people. And I believe she works closely with a local uh, treatment program folks who are dealing with their substance abuse issues and helping to th them get jobs. So I'm gonna move through a bunch more because I always think it's important to hear from the people who we set out to serve. So Jaman started his business, Good Brothers Construction and Remodeling. I'm starting this business to be a positive example to my kids and to leave a legacy behind. Um, Jaman and I are actually gonna be on the news in Kansas City tonight, so wish us luck. We're launching Determination Incorporated, a new matching grant program for formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs, and Jermon was one of the winners in the past. Uh, Samuel Lane was also one of the winners of our entrepreneurship programming, and he started his business because he desires long-term financial freedom. Um, I'm actually staring at my window at a beautifully painted house, that being mine, um, and Samuel and his guys came and did it. And for someone who works at a grassroots level and with formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs, it's awesome to actually get to do business with folks. Uh, Tanisha was trained in cosmetology and doing hair while she was in prison. And she wanted to become a stylist and run her own small salon because she has a passion for it. This is something that you'll hear a lot and see a lot. Naeem was another winner of one of our competitions. Um, he started his urban apparel business, Swag Inc to raise an awareness and inspire others to be the best versions of themselves. So this is something you'll hear a lot from folks like the professors mentioned, they wanna be able to give back and they wanna be able to stop other people from following in their footsteps and they wanna be able to help others who are coming home from incarceration and dealing with difficulties. Sean Gassaway, I have a passion for it. I'm also motivated to leave a legacy behind for my family. Um, so there's a lot of creating wealth and wanting to put your kids in a better situation than you were growing up. Uh, Hefe LLC is a local lawn and landscape business. I'm also a proud customer of Sean's. He does a great job. AC Williams, giving people the opportunity to have healthy hair and skin is a dream come true and would be a great achievement. So he and his partner uh, are making beauty products at home and selling them. So creating a revenue stream and having more ways to make money from personal passions and hobbies is one thing you'll see a lot. And then lastly, uh, Michael Mosley. If your thumbs are free, go to Instagram and follow Mo Inc 816 right now. This dude is stupid talented. Um, met Michael at our back to business workshop in a prison here in Kansas City. And the first thing he did was show me some sketches that he had done. Um, and this right here, uh, Nipsey Hustle is actually one that he had just sketched on a piece of paper in prison and uh, was able to show and then when he got home start to make into bigger and beautiful pieces and i'm also a proud customer of michael's this tattoo i have here that says home is one that he did he has a tattoo apprenticeship now we help connect him with a local tattoo business um, and he's really doing great stuff and i'll just close with this i've been in this space working with entrepreneurs for a few years now and i think the most helpful frame of reference for me when i'm thinking about entrepreneurship as a way to help formerly incarcerated people um, post prison is really framing it as a way to work out of poverty. Um, that's an experience that many people were in before prison and certainly are once they get home. And some uh, super smart folks with the Urban Institute came together and all put their heads together and asked what would it take to dramatically increase mobility from poverty and they came up with these three things economic success power and autonomy and being valued in community. And I think we can all agree that entrepreneurship is a big thing of what's in blue, yellow and green there. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to share 
And I look forward to hearing more from all the other roundtable members. Great, thank you so much, Kyle. Um, up next, we have Dr. Quan Lamar Blunt Hill, the Director of Research and Data Analytics at the Office of the Kings County District Attorney in Brooklyn, New York. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to also share my screen here just to give a brief introduction. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm the Director of Research and Data Analytics at uh, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Um, I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at Borough of Manhattan Community College in Manhattan um, and have engaged in um, criminal justice research, of course, um, as, as a criminal justice scholar um, independently and with other organizations as well. So I briefly want to just go through a, a few points on how um, I've thought about entrepreneurship and the overlap between entrepreneurship and um, those who are returning home from incarceration, um, how I've thought about that both in my work with the DA's office and in research outside of the DA's office. So um, really how I've looked at my work and also how we've looked at our work with entrepreneurs um, and, and particularly looking at returning citizens as entrepreneurs in the DA's office is really looking at to what extent we can support returning citizens becoming entrepreneurs to what extent can we promote those who are entrepreneurs to, to gear their business and hiring practices to bringing in returning citizens um, into their business? Um, and then also, how can we create an environment of entrepreneurship uh, within a community so that when returning citizens um, return, in fact, that they have a community support system that supports entrepreneurship or supports employment um, with uh, budding entrepreneurs within those communities? Um, at the prosecutor's office, this work is focused mainly on trying to find and fund programs that allow and develop skill building for potential entrepreneurs. Um, also trying to uh, promote our programs that actually seal records um, and make it so that people can actually have something closer to a fresh start without the stigma of a criminal record. And finally, larger pro-social investment within communities again, to build the idea of more entrepreneurial-minded, um, entrepreneurial-supportive communities for returning citizens and other citizens um, and residents uh, to build their business ideas into long-lasting and successful companies. Um, and finally, in, in some of my own even independent research, um, I've been able to do work with outside organizations looking at entrepreneurship as a response to collective communities tra uh, trauma, looking at entrepreneurship as a way of promoting economic development within disadvantaged communities. Um, and as a member of the Division on People of Color and Crime within the American Society of Criminology, we've also been, and I should have a second seat there, we've also been looking at ways of expanding and making accessible uh, researchers who study, uh, particularly the intersection of a criminal record and race and community um, and neighborhood location um, to try to figure out how within our own research, our own body of knowledge uh, within uh, criminology and criminal justice, that we can support entrepreneurial efforts based on how important we know such efforts can be in order to change people's individual and personal narratives, um, to promote self-esteem and to promote autonomy. Um, and also to promote all the various economic and social and more communal benefits that we know are important for reducing levels of um, crime and recidivism, but also for combating and mitigating oppressive practices that have been, um, that have been propagated by the state. Um, and so these are some of the ways that we've been thinking about how it is that we can use entrepreneurship as one of many tools in order to improve the, uh, the quality of life in the communities that these returning citizens return to, and also to improve the quality of life of our returning citizens who, of course, deserve the opportunity to rejoin um, our communities fully restored to their uh, full citizenship and residency. So thank you all. I'm really interested in um, hearing from the rest of the panels and, and talking about this topic. Um, and thanks for, for having me. Thank you. All right, um, 
Let's see. Up next, we have uh, Terrell Bram, who's the part owner in Branham's Trucking Company. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Terrell Branham. A um, little bit about myself. I was born and raised right here in Washington, D.C. I served time as a juvenile. I was incarcerated at the age of 16, all the way up until like the age of 23. 22, 23, I came home and, um, you know, just like everybody else's story. Well, that's definitely not like everybody else, but I kind of went through the same problems with like this transition in the long. And I want to touch on a few points that I just heard overall listening in. Like, you guys touched a lot of things on cue when it came to just the certain barriers that's put in place for us to have to deal with when we are released from prison. For prime example, about the training, like, there's a lot of things that I was trained on in jail, jobs that I worked in jail, and I got home, and I had to do construction and stuff like that, you know, so those was a little bit of the challenges for me when it came to just being comfortably solidified with employment and, uh, you know, after me being employed, of course, I could provide. It was just a struggle for me with that. But I worked the jobs and most of the jobs that came my way, I was, it was it was kind of diverse. I was in the office and out of the office too, you know, and I had a feel for both. And I was able to, um, I was able to um, brainstorm with my cousin about a year ago, I'd say close to a year ago. And we just sat down and started thinking about other ways, you know, to, generate web revenue because at the time i had about three jobs i was working construction i had worked on u-haul moving and storage and i also had a little cleaning contract like a cleaning contract that was an office building that i went in and cleaned like once or twice a week i'm sorry guys i'm in a house with a seven month old it's only me so that's why i'm looking at her and not the screen but um yeah that's just that was that was mainly that's how my story came about, you know, my journey to coming home and figuring it out because it was definitely um getting a little discouraging with the job thing and not knowing like if I ever be high permanently, because for the most part when I started out, I was in the temp agency. I was working under a temp agency. And day in and day out is your fingers crossed hoping that you be high permanently. You know what I mean? It's just, it was just a, I, I wasn't comfortable with my position as a temp employee, you know, so I definitely strive to do more. And, um, I made out on top from just, you know, taking advice from a lot of my peers that I was around at the time, guys that I was working on and stuff like that. And this led me to, you know, stay focused and keep at what I had going on. So I definitely, I definitely, I could definitely look back at my five year journey of being home and say, I definitely, I have a good success story. Transition Mr. from prison to business, as you guys would say. Next up, we have uh, Ms. Teresa Y. Hodge, who's the president and CEO of Mission Launch Inc and the co-founder of R3 Score. So Teresa, would you give us a few, a little bit of your thoughts? Yeah. One, thank you to the Kauffman Foundation for uh, having uh, me and hosting this very important conversation. Um, when I think of the questions of, I think Kyle provided a lot of information on why uh, people go into business who have criminal histories. I personally served a 70 month federal prison sentence um, and came home from prison. But uh, interestingly enough, I went to prison a little later in life. I went to prison when I was 44 years old. Um, I was an entrepreneur and had been an entrepreneur for 14 years. And so entrepreneurship for me was a path that I had chosen for my life um, and had thought that I would be an entrepreneur or a business owner of some sort for the rest of my life. So coming out of prison and starting a business was just natural for me. Um, I was fortunate by going to prison a little later in life, that I took very good skills to prison. 
And so for me, it was, I only, I knew I only had to survive the incarceration experience um, and just being in prison and being away from technology um, as the world was shifting and changing. And that if I could come home um, because I had a good support system and a good family structure that I took uh, into prison, that I would be able to come home and um, reset my life. Um, it was also probably the first time that I recognized how privileged I was as a Black person um, who had all of those um, factors of, of a good support system and good skill sets going into prison. Um, I came home from prison and I started Mission Launch, um, a nonprofit um, focused on helping individuals who had arrest or conviction records getting back on their feet. What we soon discovered was we could teach entrepreneurship all day long, but giving pe helping people to gain access to capital was really the hard part. Um, and some of that was because of the criminal history, the credit score. Uh, and when we looked at it, it was a combination of both the credit score and the criminal background check working together um, that was keeping individuals for being able to access the growth capital. I left um, our nonprofit and went over to start R3 Score. R3 Score is a contextualized um, background check. Um, and what we do over at R3 is we take individuals' uh, criminal histories, we lock it in place. Um, we have a criminal um, index. And so we are able to provide a standard criminal background check but we can provide the context of what does this particular record mean today? Because often when someone's looking at a criminal history, um, it's one, it's binary. It just only says yes or no, a person has a history. Um, a criminal record or a history could be 20 years ago. And so in this present moment, decision makers are making decisions about who is this person today, but the criminal record is talking about yesterday. That is static and old data. And what we know is people are uh, dynamic and people change. Um, and so um, we take that information, we provide a one to 10 score around the criminal history, and then we provide a, an advanced score. And the advanced score is similar to a credit score, 300 to 850. And so this allows decision makers to be able to have some new data points around the person who's in front of them who's trying to access data. The reason why this is important is nine out of 10 employers run a criminal background check. Uh, we know four out of five landlords, three out of five universities and financial institutions do all manner of things and all decision makers often um, use dirty data, which is just searching the internet um, to just see what's out there. So it's hard to um, escape. Um, a criminal history, quite frankly. Um, for me, I wanna just like really touch on the second question, which is what does it mean for our communities? You know, if we, and I'll add to that, if we allow individuals who have criminal histories to be able to become fully productive citizens, I think when we look at that, um, on an individual level, it means that we all benefit when we allow everyone to bring their God-given talent um, to the space and to be able to, and for every able body to take care of themselves and their families. Um, there is a tremendous benefit to the family um, if we're able to uh, allow family, all family members to participate in the economic opportunity and the economic future of that family. Obviously society, uh, communities um, will benefit and society at large benefits when we allow everyone to be able to participate. I think even more so today in a post COVID world and reality, we have to make sure that we clear the brush for everyone to be able to participate um, in this American dream and this American experience. So I'm super excited. Um, I love all of the ways that uh, Kyle has demonstrated why people um, start a business. And I agree, there's no one way um, and there's no one way that's right. It's, it's really about what's right for that individual. And some of that speaks to where they live, um, how, long, how far away are they away from their criminal history? Um, what are they interested in doing and all manner of other things. So I think that we have to open our minds to one, who we send to prison and how are we gonna allow citizens to come back and reconnect to society? Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, and then uh, our last panelist, 
is Mr. Brian Kelly, who's the CEO of the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. So Brian, would you mind sharing some of your thoughts? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Kelly, I'm CEO of the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. We're a social enterprise that's headquartered in Houston, Texas. PEP unites business executives and inmates through entrepreneurial passion and servant leadership to transform lives, restore families, and rebuild communities. We've been transforming lives for nearly 17 years. And in that time, we've touched the lives of over 4,000 inmates, graduating about 2,800 during that time. Uh, over 500 businesses have been started by our graduates, and the top 20 of which had revenues or sales of over a million dollars last year. So some pretty significant businesses. You know, our intensive training in character and entrepreneurship not only builds outstanding second chance entrepreneurs, it molds great intrapreneurs as well. Our graduates, with the help of our um, case management team and our extensive network, find it easy to get a job post-release. For nine years straight, we've had 100% employment within 90 days, averaging a first job in just 22 days. Starting wage is about 1284. Um, at the one-year mark, they're typically making over 17. Um, and, and through our extensive survey work, we found that our graduates exhibit economic mobility unheard of in the second chance population. At the three year mark, when most release inmates are going back to prison, our men are earning an average of $24 an hour. And I think that's getting into the livable wage category. Uh, you know, of course, the gold standard of all prison reform efficacy is, is recidivism. You know, how many people are going back to prison within three years? During our 17 year history, our recidivism numbers by cohort have hovered around seven or 8% for our program graduates. But if a man sticks with us for just six months post release, benefiting from our case management and our continuing education in our community, the recidivism number drops to 4%. Let me state that another way. We are 96% effective at taking gang leaders and turning them into servant leaders, of taking tax burdens and turning them into taxpayers. You know, there, there have been a number of uh, third party evaluations of PEP. Two years ago, renowned Harvard business strategy professor Michael Porter's Boston think tank, uh, the Initiative for Competitive Inner City, did an evaluation of the economic impact of PEP on Texas. They found that our transformational training created an economic boom for the state of Texas in direct job creation. 471 jobs in our sample, uh, a $67 million value add to the state and a $4.3 million savings to the state in reduced criminal justice costs. That study showed that PEP with a paltry budget of about $2.8 million at the time provided a 794% return on investment. But the impact on our communities was way higher than that. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is not just a feel good thing. It, it, entrepreneurship for this population isn't just about feeling good and, and doing good, although it certainly is that it's financially and fiscally responsible. Uh, we all benefit when we take somebody caught in that perpetual cycle of poverty and crime and we turn them into real producers, proud parents, philanthropists even. You know, entrepreneurship is a great vehicle for change. It's a great vehicle for change for this population. And we've proven that case for over 17 years now. And by the way, I'm not just the chief executive officer. I'm also a graduate of the program. I've been out about six years, having done nearly 22 years. And the things I learned in PEP has enabled me to do what I do now. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be on this panel. I uh, love what you're doing. Thanks. Great to meet you, Robert. All right, everyone. Thanks for sharing your, your thoughts initially. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you. Really do want it to be a conversation where we all share back and forth um so you know the the title of the session is why do returning citizens start businesses and what does it mean for communities um and so if we're talking about a why question um you know in, in the research world nerds like me we, we have a study and there's this outcome variable you're trying to predict and if you you know think of your quintessential entrepreneur silicon valley model mark zuckerberg you know, you're predicting billions of dollars that they want to make or some radical innovation. But, you know, in this context, the outcomes that we could be looking at could be very different, um, both at a personal level. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurship researchers are starting to look at all sorts of other things besides just profit 
and then also at a community level. So I'd love to hear your thoughts if, if you could help us kind of come up with an elevator pitch of all of the wonderful things that could happen um, for entrepreneurs in this context. Like what, what would those things be, especially things that you think people aren't thinking about? Um, what, what results from entrepreneurship? I'll take a stab at some of this. Um, for me, I think that individuals with criminal histories um, or entrepreneurs um, at large seek to solve a problem. And, you know, certainly uh, our criminal justice system, our legal system, um, the reentry process um, is a problem um, for a lot of people. And I think individuals who have that direct experience um, are well suited to not only um, go out and just start just general businesses, but to start businesses um, that could improve the outcomes um, for other people with records. Um, I can't re remember which one of the professors, I think it was Professor uh, Egam who stated that um, individuals with criminal histories are more likely to hire other people with criminal histories um, and also to be in a position to understand the importance of providing a livable wage uh, to these employees. Um, I think that it's possible, quite frankly, for uh, people with records to start all types of businesses. And not all of them are going to be social enterprises. Some of them are going to be pure um, plays. And I think that we have to expand um, our view of who goes to prison, who's coming home from prison, and what they're capable of. Um, some people need a basic job because that is their capacity, that is going to be their contribution. However, I think we have to leave room for the next big idea to come out of an American prison. Robert, if you don't mind, I want to kind of chime in on that. I, I want to uh, piggyback on uh, what Teresa said because, uh, you know, entrepreneurship fits our population so well. Um, I, I spoke at a university uh, uh, in Texas a while back uh, to some entrepreneurship students and I asked them, hey, what's an entrepreneur? And I got crickets, right? And I said, no, come on, come on. I want to hear that. What's this? And a feeble hand went up in the back and said, an entrepreneur is somebody who recognizes obstacles or gaps, but sees them as opportunities, opportunities to make money or opportunities to make a difference. Now, this population that we have that fits them perfectly from their survival on the street. They know about supply chains and risk management and profit margins and marketing and sales and reading people and recognizing opportunities. But they've also dug a hole for themselves and they've created more obstacles and they need to be able to see the opportunities even in that. And so, you know, with a little bit of coaching, with a little bit of help, with a little bit of encouragement, they can recognize those opportunities. Yeah, you know, I, I speak with every one of our class and I say, hey, when you get out, I promise you, I can get you a $10 an hour job immediately. And you're going to love it. For 30 days, you're going to be humping and hustling. And then all of a sudden you're going to realize, man, you're breaking even, you know, even living in our transitional house that costs nothing, uh, you know, it's going to be breaking even. I said, so you're going to try to find a car, even a lower entry level car, you know, you're, you better be making $14 an hour to be able to pay that car, but you're still going to be breaking even. And so pretty soon after, you know, you're driving a car, you're making $14 an hour, you're going to want your own place, you better be making 18 bucks an hour now, but you're still going to be breaking even. And I know by that time you got a car in your own place, you're going to want a girlfriend. And if you're not factoring in $400 a month for that, you're not going to have a girlfriend for very long, right? And so I said, now you better be making $22 an hour or more, but you're still breaking even. And so how many of you can get out and very quickly make $25 an hour or more? And very few hands go up. They've never done that. They've never made 50 grand a year. And I say, that's the brilliance of entrepreneurship. You can create wealth, you can create economic mobility. And even in our training for entrepreneurship, it makes them more valuable to other employers and they're great entrepreneurs as well. I'd question, like to pick you back again. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go brother. I'm sorry, yeah. I will, um... I was just thinking. I was just thinking, listening to the fella talk, and um, I definitely like to piggyback off of that because that's true. Like, while I was incarcerated at a young age, like sixteen, my mom she was under the DC housing law, the Section Eight thing, 
And due to me having a felony, felony at the time, I wasn't able to, man, I couldn't be on release any longer. So closer to me getting released, I was kind of having a concern of where I was going to stay. I knew I had to go to the halfway house and that was about five months, but I still was concerned to know like where I'm going to stay. And it just all is levels. It was a chain, like it just a, ch a chain of levels to where though, all right, I came home and all the words that I had while I was in jail about housing and employment and stuff like that, I obtained those things. So I got home, I saved up money while I was in a halfway house. After the halfway house, I got an apartment, me and my first girl, me and my girlfriend at the time. Well, not at the time, my, my same girlfriend. We got a baby together now. But um, yeah, at that time, so I still like was breaking even, you know, because I was working three jobs and I'm having to pay rent. I have a little car to get back and forth and stuff like that. But you, everything you got to pay for that type of stuff, you know, and then me actually living this life for the first time because I went in so young, it was all new to me. You know, so managing in the beginning was hard and I ran into a lot of obstacles and things like that. But that's when it was like, okay, it's time to do more. You know, I know I could, I know I could do more, so it's time to do more. And that's where the business aspect came about as far as brainstorming and just figuring out what's next, what I'm going to get into and how it's going to work. I'm going to make it work, you know, and it just... It, it, it all started from there, you know. So I guess my experience of me just working jobs and working jobs and seeing that I still wasn't, you know, stable enough, it made me take a little more control of what I had going on and what I wanted to do. What's your little one's name, Terrell? Her name's Data. She loves strings. Uh, hey, oh, hey. Oh, 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 oh. Awesome. Angel. Robert, um, in answer to your question about like what are some of the tangential benefits of supporting second chance entrepreneurs, one of the things I think of, so we do a lot of storytelling, you know, just talking about the folks that we've worked with, kind of like I did early. And when people in the community, just everyday individuals, get to hear stories about formerly incarcerated people succeeding through entrepreneurship, it starts to make them think a little bit different and break down some of those stigmas and stuff. Because a lot of the folks who come from privileged lifestyles like me, like we don't even think we know a felon. Like we don't think we know anyone who's been to prison. It may or may not be true, but you just kind of get this idea that like felons or whatever are scary people. So breaking down some of those stigmas I think is really important because what, what those professors were talking about earlier with like policy changes and stuff, there's a lot the national government can do, sure, but there's a whole lot the state government can do to break down barriers to people with felonies. And there's a whole lot your municipal government can do. And there's a whole lot your workplace can do. So if an individual has a different frame of mind about someone with a felony, they can go talk to their HR rep and say, do we hire people with a record? And find out the answer and just kind of take it from there. I mean, there's just a lot that can be done at the grassroots level that we don't have to wait for whatever administration to figure out. All right, well, I'll kind of go to the next question then. Um, so there's a great research paper that was published in, in a journal called Administrative Science Quarterly where some individuals went inside of a prison, a female prison, and they looked at a, an organization that hired inmates while they were in prison and you know helped them do um, it was a call center, but they taught them real skills. The CEO would talk to them, ask for feedback. And the paper is basically talking about how um, these individuals received respect at this job from this organization. For the first time, many of them felt respected. And then that helped them envision kind of a future self that was outside of the prison system. Um, if we think back to our earlier panel, a lot of the benefits of organizations such as PEP and other organizations, we talk about a lot in terms of skill development or like kind of hard skills. So I guess my question to you is, if we have kind of both potential benefits of training programs and just of other other things, maybe the, if you want to say soft skills, you could think of that way, just sort of a mindset shift or positive uh, identity or, or self-respect. And then you have like kind of hard skill development. 
it's unfair to say which is more important because that's a false dichotomy they can reinforce each other but i'd still like to hear your thoughts about in your opinion what's the more pressing issue is it actual uh, training on you know having a mini mba or, or things of that nature or is it more of helping people have a different mindset and just leverage what they already have robert if you mind i'd like to chime in on that um one of the things that I have shared many times, and it sometimes ruffles a little bit of feathers, is that job skills is not the it's not the problem. And uh, everybody's like, "What?" It, it, because there's a big consensus around that. But there's a lot of people that go to prison with great job skills, right? Character is the platform that we start with. You've got to build that character of making the right decisions in the right place, putting your, yourself in a place to succeed. Our population inside of prison has very few marks in the win column. And when we invite them to PEP, it's a nine month program that's like, I don't know, a Navy SEAL boot camp for nine months. And they're doing college level uh, curriculum supplemented with uh, case studies from Harvard Business School. And so they realize they can do a lot more than they thought they could with support around them, encouraging them. Then we start to get some marks in the win column and confidence builds. And they realize, man, I can do much more if I have the community to tap into. So there are three pillars that we really um, operate around. That's character is addressing our wounds and making sure we know who we are and, and what our capabilities are. Community is having the right people around us to support us, encourage us, educate us and walk with us and not pull us down. But then capital, and by, by capital, I mean not just money, but um, access to resources. Um, access to uh, a, a different vision for things. And it's so difficult for folks to obtain startup capital for their business or growth capital because of their felony on their record, because of their previous banking history that at best is bad um, and at worst is just non-existent. And so we started a second chance friendly uh, bank, a, a lending arm last year called Entree Capital because uh, so few of our guys know, even if they have a great business concept and it started well, can't go to the bank and get a loan, can't get funding. And so we're making a second chance friendly lending arm called Entree Capital so they can go get that. But we're also wrapping uh, support around them, you know, advisors, mentors, uh, consultants to make, to make sure that they've got everything necessary to succeed so we're not handing out money uh, frivolously uh, but we've also brought in impact investors uh, you know wealthy people across the country who want to make a difference who have a DAF fund that they're giving out of anyway who would love to provide low interest loans get their money back and redeploy and and so this man just involves the community in a community healing event Yeah, I think I would agree 100% um, with everything that um, Brian said. And then also um, to go back to your question, um, I think what's most important um, is what each individual needs. Um, I went to a prison, you know, as a woman, I went to a prison with women. And so what I learned um, there were, there were certain things that were the same for all of us, but there were various communities. Some people needed an, a mini MBA program and others needed soft skills. Others needed more money management skills. And for others, they had never uh, really fully connected to community in a, in a meaningful and a productive way. So they needed a path that they could connect to community. They needed to know what was gonna be their first stop out the gate um, so that their first 100 days they could get some of those wins that Brian was talking about under their belt. Um, but I think that when we look at the number of people who are in prison and we look at the number of people who come home um, annually, we have to be careful not to ask questions of what does 650,000 people who are coming home um, need because it is unique. Um, and a lot of that is going to depend on where are they coming to and what resources um, are available. But I do, you know, I think we have to take all of these things into consideration and see if we can create more of an individualized approach to allowing people to um, connect to community, how it makes the most sense, but at the same time, making sure that uh, we all have some very baseline 
um, some of our hierarchy of needs um, as individuals, as well as as entrepreneurs available to us. I um, also respond uh, to that question. I, I think this is perhaps one that I'm um, uh, much better able to respond to than the last because as um, a researcher in a district attorney's office, we're thinking societally, right, structurally, system systemically. Um, what I'll say, so uh, personally, my research tends to surround the idea of identity and how identity is formed. Um, I don't think that it's a choice between job skill or the softer skills, um, as you know it, Robert, because the acquisition of those harder skills actually is a, like a part of shaping that soft skill identity of a person. Um, some of my work, quite a bit of it actually draws on the idea of narrative identity and how important it is for us to have a sustainable and cohesive story of who we are and how that story of who we are helps guide what we do. So I'm in part talking to you all in this panel because I have this vision of myself as a scholar and as a researcher who's qualified to do this. If I had a different vision of myself, maybe as a basketball player, I probably wouldn't be spending my time talking to you on the panel. And so that story of yourself becomes really, really important, but it's, 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 it's greatly influenced by what we would consider the harder thing. So um, we should keep that in mind as well, that um, all aspects um, of that person are being shaped by whatever program we're having. Um, and so that if you're shaping some sort of program, some sort of service, some sort of training for individuals, you have to be considering if, if, if you're trying to get the most benefit the whole person experience of that training, that program, that skill building, whatever it is. Um, one other thing that I, I like to know is when we're talking about returning citizens, um, it's important to remember when we say returning citizens, so those who are returning from incarceration, it's not just the prisoners that have been away for 20, 30 years. Um, actually, most returning citizens here in New York are returning from jail and even the prisoners that are returning in, in New York are returning from relatively short stints. Um, and they may very possibly be returning from, uh, you know, doing uh, prison time for crimes um, that are not necessarily typically associated in the mind of the common, you know, citizen with prison time. Um, and so those are also important things. So Kyle, your point on the fact that it's important that people know the population of folks that we're talking about, that you have exposure to returning citizens, that's actually critically important because it expands the view for citizens and residents to understand then what is this population that we're talking about. I think that's important um, because as I say, as a criminal justice professor, and, and I think it's, it's important for everybody here on this call, um, who I'm imagining are mostly non-returning uh, citizens, um, is that the criminal justice system, when we think about it, we think about, about this system that's over here and that needs a lot of tinkering, but actually um, the criminal justice system doesn't start with police and then go to courts and then corrections. It actually starts with criminal law and an elected government and so the criminal justice system that we have is actually reflective of the decisions that we have made as individual citizens. Um, that means that if we like more entrepreneurs, um, we like our returning citizens to be able to be involved in more entrepreneurship activities, um, that it's not just up to us to send them the folks like Brian and say, hey, you guys like do all the work and make sure they can um, be successful. But as folks like Brian and Teresa and Kyle, um, as you all are doing that work to, despite all the obstacles that we as society have set in front of those individuals, allow them to be successful, it is also incumbent on the rest of us to now think, oh, well, we should probably remove some of those obstacles. Um, and, and I'll just finish up by saying that I, I would also um, warn that the entrepreneurs and the stories of entrepreneurial success that we see um, are typically more extraordinary stories. Um, and so we have to make sure then that it's not, it, it, it's not just entrepreneurship that we're offering, but that, for instance, those who become entrepreneurs, that we as a society are providing a supportive system for them to maintain their businesses, because actually most of the returning citizens that are helped will be helped by those returning citizen entrepreneurs. So we need to make sure that fewer of their businesses go out of business because they can't maintain capital investments or because other obstacles come in to give them legal troubles or otherwise, but to make sure that they have the platforms to hire more folks who don't necessarily want to go 
go through the accounting that is required to maintain a business or the legal issues that are um, um, required to maintain a business. Um, and so I think I, I just want to finish up by centering, um, at least from the perspective of those of us who are not returning citizens, are not going to be entrepreneurs ourselves, the role that we can have in creating an environment that really supports the work of those individuals and the positive pro social benefit that they'll have in the communities in which they serve. Excellent. Well, thank yeah. you guys all so much. Can um, I do one thing real fast? Do we have sure. a second? Just a quick comment, I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes to everything the other panelists just said. Um, I, I think a helpful metaphor for me is like entrepreneurship and that mini MBA you're describing is like throwing seeds into the ground and you have to make sure that the ground is fertile. And a lot of people aren't in a position in life where their like personal ground is very fertile. So folks, uh, many people who are in prison, it's a result of mental health issues and substance abuse and systematic poverty. All three of those things made worse by the cancer of systematic racism in our communities. So you gotta make sure that you deal with the foundation before you can build anything on top of it. And there's no reason for the federal government and stuff from the top down to get ahead of the grassroots and folks working on things in their own communities and with one another, because otherwise it's just not going to be put to very much good use. So I do think it's important to consider that um, public dollars likely, and it's just depends on the budget where you are, but need to be focused on basic reentry, on supporting mental health, on substance abuse issues, on alleviating the effects of systematic poverty, more than they need to be put towards supporting entrepreneurship programs. And perhaps though that there are other pockets of money out there that can support second chance entrepreneurs like corporations getting behind this sort of thing. This doesn't have to be solved from the government. There are lots of very interesting ways to support these sorts of things. All right, well, thank you all so much. Excellent panel. I hope everybody can see the passion and the knowledge and the great unique perspectives that uh, we have here. I'd love to continue the conversation for another couple hours. It's rare that I get to talk to other people that are interested in the same topics and I find there's a whole lot of people that are really interested, so that's awesome. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next uh, panel and our next uh, moderator. This is Mr. Rod Martinez, a sociologist from the University of Maryland. And we're going to be talking about policy priorities and interventions and entrepreneurship support of formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs. So thanks very much. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to begin by thanking you all for, for joining us today. Um, as, a, as I was just introduced, my name is Rod Martinez. I'm a doctoral student in sociology at the University of Maryland, where a lot of my work uh, examines formerly incarcerated men in Washington, D.C., here in the District of Columbia, civic engagement, activism, and racial capitalism. Uh, today, I have the distinct pleasure of being the moderator for this, for this panel on policy priorities and intervention interventions in entrepreneurship, support of formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs. Um, our esteemed panelists today include uh, renowned experts on these issues. And just as a reminder, each panelist will have about seven minutes. And at the end of these presentations, we'll take questions, which you can put in the chat. Um, just as a reminder, again, thank you all so very much for being with us today, talking about these important issues that we all care a lot about. Um, and to start us off first, uh, we have Dr. Howard Henderson, who is a professor of justice administration and director of the Center for Justice Research at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas. Um, he is also a non-resident senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Howard is an expert on culturally responsive criminal justice research, program evaluation and predictive bias. An equity-focused criminologist, Howard's research, Dr. Howard's research takes a systems-based approach to understand policy and program effects. Good morning. Well, yes, good morning for us still here uh, in the central time zone. So uh, thank you for the great panels this morning. I've learned a lot, I've taken a lot of notes uh, and, and thank you for moderating and having me a part of this discussion. I, I wanna contextualize this panel uh, with some, some basic data points, but also to springboard uh, my fellow panelists in, in a broader discussion of how we understand the system, how we transform the system, and how we transform the culture. When you think about where we are, we are about five decades into 
uh, significant draconian policies as they have looked for the last few decades. When we look at mass incarceration and what that really means, when we think about the degree and extent to which disenfranchisement blocks people from jobs, uh, from housing, from educational opportunities, we recognize that we have a problem. When you think about the fact that there are some 50,000 legal restrictions that are prominent around the United States, but you also think about the rate of joblessness that is found among individuals who are returning to our community and their inability to obtain uh, suitable employment. When you think about how destructive this has been to Black and Latinx communities, when you think about the, the, the fact that the criminal record has been devastating to many communities, particularly the Black and Latinx communities, but you also think about the need for us to address structural, cultural, and institutional barriers, which we oftentimes don't really talk about. We recognize that today there are millions of Americans who are living with a criminal conviction. Uh, in fact, the research tells us that, particularly in minority communities, one in three adults at some point in their lifetime will have a criminal record. Uh, when we think about arrest, when we think about conviction, when we think about the systematic blocking of these individuals from getting jobs, uh, from obtaining housing, educational opportunities at both the federal, state, and local level. We understand the need to have this system-wide discussion. And so I applaud uh, this conversation that we've been able to have all day today because I think that through this continued dialogue, we're going to be able to find the solutions. Around the country, we understand that the nature of the criminal justice system has a historical standpoint. We need to be able to contextualize that and understand the evolution and how we got to where we are. The research tells us that there are about 650,000 Americans who return to our communities every year from prison. Half of those individuals, the research tells us, will return within three years. Uh, these people are in need of, of suitable employment. They need housing. They need educational opportunities. But more importantly, they need a community that's going to be open and receptive to their return. Because of these pervasive discrimination issues, because of the criminal record, nearly 75% of those people who are formerly incarcerated are still unemployed within a year of their release. A lack of this employment creates devastating realities in our community. When you think about what we're able to do, when you think about the conversations that we have, when you think about the fact that we don't ever really talk about the structural realities of this, we miss the issue sometimes. I mean, we understand the data points. What we don't really know how to do well is transform the system. And so today I'm looking forward to this conversation and making sure that we're able to focus on the structural, cultural, and institutional barriers. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Henderson. Um, yeah, I definitely agree on sort of uh, being able to contextualize a lot of the things we're talking about, right, and putting, putting them through a structural lens. Um, and so our next speaker is Dr. Annalise Goger, um, who is a Dev David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Metrop Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Um, Dr. Goger is an econ economic geographer focused on developing innovative policy solutions to address rising inequality and increased access to economic opportunity. Her recent work investigates the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States and examines how to prevent further inequality by strengthening safety nets and community support infrastructures for displaced workers and small businesses. She is an expert in the US workforce development policy, global supply chains and inclusive economic development. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be part of this panel. And, um, and I also want to reiterate the theme that I'm hearing across everyone, which is that, that solving these problems um, is not only a policy problem, but also an implementation problem. How do you coordinate these activities and make sure there's equal access uh, to support in making a transition um, into a job, into housing, et cetera. Um, and I also want to emphasize uh, kind of a broader theme around shifting the emphasis within policy from continual punishment to actually supporting people to make a successful transition. And so with that in mind, I'm going to summarize a few remarks on both with regard to our policy on entrepreneurship but also our policy on, on training, um, being a, an expert on the workforce development system. Um, 
So I want to draw a, a little bit from some of my colleagues' work. In particular, Andrew Perry has uh, been doing a lot of work on supporting Black entrepreneurs. And he finds some really striking things just about entrepreneurship generally and the racial inequalities um, that, that are uh, happening in that space. So first of all, he finds that 14% of the population um, is Black, but only 2.2% of business owners uh, that have more than one employee are black. Um, and in COVID-19, 41% of black businesses have closed compared to 17% for white owned businesses. And also that black entrepreneurs are denied for loans at about two and a half times the rate of white applicants. And then, you know, reading through some of the work of some of my other colleagues like Joseph Perilla, um, we, he, they go into why, uh, why, what, what's causing this. So there's, there's the racial wealth gap. Um, there's also the fact that many of these businesses are undercapitalized and find it hard to access financing, that there's um, lower educational attainment um, in disenfranchised communities. Um, and so this is the context of when you add a conviction record to that picture and the things that, for example, Teresa Hodge was pointing out around background checks and credit reporting checks, um, it adds a, yet another barrier to trying to start a business. Um, and so um, one of the things that my colleague Joseph Perilla did in a recent blueprint was to propose creating a federal program to fund minority business accelerators. Um, so this would provide capital to community development and financing institutions that are already working in disenfranchised communities. Um, and also providing technical assistance and business training. Um, so I think this is essential, but I think we also need to think very intentionally about how these types of programs could work uh, to meet the needs and be accessible for returning citizens. So some of the thoughts uh, that I have about that are, one, providing um, more pre-release education about what types of local organizations can support people if they wanna start a business. Um, and then really connecting them, doing warm handoffs to those organizations, not just sort of uh, throwing people out without any sense of where to go. Um, increasing the policy focus on networking opportunities um, and figuring out how to connect returning citizens with the types of networks that can help them access capital. Um, providing more digital skills education um, within you know, pre-release um, in in including training on things like bookkeeping, um, personal finance, business finance, business planning, those kinds of, of things. Um, getting people set up with basic documents before release. So making sure everyone has a, a legal ID, make sure they have enrollment in any programs they might qualify for like healthcare or SNAP. Um, and, and making sure that, um, that the re-entry organizations, the American Job Centers, all these organizations are involved even before release so that somebody's not um, going out to an environment where they're, they're not really sure where to start. Um, and the second set of, of remarks I want to make focuses on our training and career services infrastructure. Um, so the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is the main federal legislation overseeing our workforce system, but I would actually argue that we don't have a system. What we have is a set of very siloed and fragmented programs that don't connect to each other. And for this conversation, most importantly, those, those systems do not, between criminal justice and job centers, we have 20, 2,400 American job centers across the country um, and we want to see more integration between them in the reauthorization process uh, that's coming up soon on the Hill. Um, so I also want to talk about some of the specific policy barriers. So there's a disincentive for job centers to enroll anyone seeking entrepreneurship assistance because the way that those job centers are evaluated on their performance relies on wage records. Self-employed people are not included in wage records. So that means that if I'm a, a counselor trying to decide who to enroll, I'm not gonna get credit for placing someone or getting earnings, which are my performance metrics, because the data that my state is pulling down typically doesn't include self-employed people. So in general, there's a lot of uh, lack of incentive to, in, to work on entrepreneurship training, to help people get uh, started in a business in the job center environment because the data systems aren't capturing self-employed individuals. And I think we need to rethink 
not only the performance metrics, but also the data systems to make sure that states, for example, can provide supplemental data so that those people can be counted. Um, another really specific barrier is that um, performance measures, because of all the hiring barriers and employment uh, issues that we're seeing among uh, people that have a record because of things like blanket background checks and so on, um, the counselors know that, that the person who has a record isn't likely to get placed in a job or have earnings compared to other candidates. And even though there are a lot of, um, in, a lot of things written in the legislation about trying to serve people that have a record or other people with barriers to employment. In practice, um, there's like not an easy way for that uh, counselor to know if I enroll these people here that have a record versus these people over here that don't, like they're more likely to enroll the people that don't because they're, they're, they're more likely to have positive performance. Uh, so there's this issue around attention in the legislation. And I think we need to think in reauthorization about um, reevaluating the performance metrics and how they create these perverse incentives um, to kind of counteract the goals of the legislation uh, to focus on people that have barriers to employment. Um, and so then I want to raise a couple of just, I know I'm, I'm running up against time, so I'll, I'll talk about a few things that I think we could also think through um, in policy conversations. So one is, I think we need to build on a project, a demonstration project called Le Linking Employment Activities and uh, Pre-Release Services. So they put job centers in 20 jails. And what they found is that it really helped shift the culture within the jail from a punishment focus to a focus on, on helping people have a successful transition over time. Um, but there were also a lot of technological barriers. So even though there were supposed to be 20 sites, only 14 of them succeeded in getting internet access. And so I think we need a federal emphasis on making sure there's broadband, internet access, and um, security protocols established throughout both prisons and jails to make sure that you don't, if you're trying to do a demonstration, you can actually get a project set up that includes internet access um, without having to go through a lot of crazy approval processes. Um, another point I wanna make is that we've done two major federal demonstrations about entrepreneurship, the Project Gate and the SET demonstration. And one thing that, I, that they found in the Project Gate is that when people had unemployment benefits, their business success was greater. Now, because returning citizens are not entitled to unemployment benefits, I think we need to think about income support as a way to really boost the effect of entrepreneurship training programs. Um, and then also they found that women's outcomes were lower than men's. And I think that that comes back to things like making sure that issues like childcare and other supportive services for women are part of the program design. Um, I think subsidized employment is an option we can look into expanding and making sure that people have access to that first work experience. Um, and then finally, I think that apprenticeship offers a really promising solution for people who are returning, um, both because it gives you that on-site experience, but also a structured education program and strong mentorship. Um, there's a program called Next Chapter that SLAP, Slack is leading that's starting to expand into other companies. Um, and they work with the Last Mile and, and San Quentin program in San Francisco um, that really hopes build out those, um, those types of programs. Um, the new legislation that has passed the House and is now going to the Senate would expand funding for intermediaries that help uh, connect apprentices to employers. And this would really help, I think we should really think about making sure that some of those intermediaries are reentry organizations that can help uh, connect people into apprenticeship opportunities um, with intention and making sure that those programs are accessible. Um, we're doing it just to plug an event we're doing on Monday uh, about the business case for apprenticeship. And I think this, you know, this will come up in that event uh, at Brookings. It's, it's at 3.30 Eastern time and it's on the Brookings event website. Um, so I think there's a powerful economic development case to be made for reporting for supporting returning citizens um, who are trying to start a business or find a job. Um, 
And I think that it has to be rooted in a holistic approach that helps people make sure they have the basics set up like housing, transportation, you know, healthcare, health insurance. Um, before we try to focus too much on, you know, if you're going to start a business, it's really hard to do that if, if you have a health event and you have no health insurance, right? So I think we need to think in this holistic way. And um, yeah, I think that this is a really good window of opportunity to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Goger. And definitely a lot of those points are uh, parts of what we're gonna hopefully get into our discussion some more because there was a lot raised there. Um, and our next panelist is Mr. Brent Oral, um, who is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute where his work uh, focuses on job training, uh, workforce development and criminal justice reform. Specifically, his research focuses on expanding opportunity for all Americans through improved work readiness job training and improving the performance of the criminal justice system through rehabilitation and prisoner reentry programs. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone uh, for uh, being with us this morning, now afternoon. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, sharing with you some thoughts that we've been developing over at uh, AEI um, through a um, re-entry reform um, working group uh, that met for a couple of years beginning in 2018. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting to you, um, I don't want to misrepresent this, this is not a consensus view of this working group. Uh, it was more uh, my reflection um, on what that re-entry working group um, looked at and a possible connection between what I learned out of that discussion and this um, uh, this uh, topic that we're addressing today around entrepreneurship. All right, so again, entrepreneurship and personal agency. And I was really interested in what I heard in the previous panel on this topic of where do we begin uh, in kind of preparing people for uh, uh, re-entry. Um, and uh, just a, a couple framing thoughts here. Uh, when we think about uh, populations that are disproportionately involved in the criminal justice system, I think it's really important um, to think about that, think about incarceration as part of a long-term continuum that's really affecting too many people in our uh, in our community. People in prison um, have often been subject to multiple efforts by public and private organizations, schools, uh, social services, religious institutions, and juvenile justice that have been working to try to prevent a negative criminal justice outcome. Um, uh, and I, I am in no way uh, disparaging any of that effort. I, in my view, and I, I, uh, I'd be interested in what the other panelists have to say about this, but it, it, I think that one of the effect of, effects of this these multiple interventions is to interfere with this development of personal agency, a sense of control and self-efficacy in managing uh, the, the individual's ability to manage their own life. And when you look at it this way, uh, we can think of incarceration as simply the most regimented form of intervention. And I think it is uniquely corrosive of personal agency when people are in an institution in which every aspect of their lives is controlled, monitored, uh, and there's very little in the way of choice, uh, of self-direction that I think is so uh, so important to an effective re-entry um, program. So we, uh, we uh, this group of scholars uh, that came together at AEI uh, put together a volume, an edited volume, on rethinking reentry, that we called rethinking reentry, examining what we know about efforts to effectively reintegrate uh, the formerly incarcerated, and we had uh, we had participation by uh, government officials as well as scholars just to engage in a really um, what I what I found to be a fascinating and really helpful conversation over uh, again about an eighteen month period. One of the things that came out of that conversation was uh, a study that some of you have probably encountered or heard the author talk about Pam Lattimore from 
uh, the Research Triangle Institute, um, in which she went back and looked at all of the evaluations of uh, the various reentry programs that have been attempted over the last um, several decades. And what she found was instructive because uh, what she found was that there's very limited evidence um, uh, that these programs, uh, many, most of these programs uh, have had a positive impact in reducing recidivism. And in some instances, uh, she pointed out, the control groups um, for these studies uh, actually did uh, somewhat better than the treatment groups. So uh, that's that's concerning because what we don't want to do is uh, is make things worse in our effort to um, in our effort to help. So the essay that I contributed to the volume, which is the last one in the book, uh, and again, I want to emphasize my views, not the views of the of the working group, is that we need to test some new approaches that are built around, um, uh, the idea of helping to rebuild or perhaps build for the first time a sense of personal agency. And what we, what I came up with out of all of these conversations uh, was this idea of experimenting with um, a kind of very rigorous um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy approach that involved individualized and quite separated units um, where uh, people in prison are really um, uh, immersed in a, a CBT process that involves everyone who touches them, other inmates, obviously, but also staff, um, and, um, and, and really creates a holistic, uh, again, immersive experience that that and that that be uh, to, to kind of unwind the traumas that that often underlie the um, the criminal behaviors. There would be a, a participant directed reentry planning. So there would be coaches there working with uh, the individuals who are in the CBT unit. But we would start with asking the individual what it is that they want, what they need, what their goals and objectives are helping them to identify the kinds of barriers that they might be facing and then really developing a plan uh, that is, again, owned by uh, the person who is in prison. And at the end of that, at the end of a successful completion, what I suggested is that rather than um, hand them off to another organization or just hand them off to a, uh, the, the community corrections and monitoring par parole and probation, that we um, look at uh, providing them with a re-entry account that they, again, they control. And the idea is the resources in this re-entry account could be used to um, uh, procure either services or address needs like housing or transportation that are associated with the reentry plan that the individual addressed, and they'd have to be monitored and uh, expenditures validated, and so on. Again, the idea here is trying to build up this sense of self-efficacy and control um, with uh, for the the person uh, who's returning. So, entrepreneurship um, is a very high order form, I think, of this idea of personal agency. Uh, you know. It is a complex um, matter to bring a new product or service to market. Uh, it, it, it requires a lot of skill. It requires a lot of support. Uh, and what I thought of as I was preparing for this is whether we could explore um, kind of business development uh, coaching and ownership um, strategies while people are going through um, the CBT-based um, uh, uh, unit uh, to develop this, uh, you know, personal agency around the idea of entrepreneurship, um, and I and I I was also encouraged uh, in the last panel to hear people talking about 
the need for a variety of approaches for individuals that would be tailored to their interests and needs. Not everyone wants to be a business owner, right? Not everyone um, wants or has a, a, a set of skills that lend itself to that. And some would prefer to uh, you know, pursue different training uh, uh, options, employment opportunities. Uh, and we need to be good with that. We need to, again, focus on the incarcerated person as the main actor in the story that we're trying to help develop. Um, and uh, I, I think that there are some, uh, some innovative models uh, that we could use for financing and supporting business startups, the reentry accounts, perhaps resources uh, in the proposed reentry accounts would be available to support a, a startup. Um, there are some interesting models being developed around the country through the Community Independence Initiative uh, out in uh, the Bay Area that really focuses on small capital injections for new businesses, very small businesses, to help them get started uh, rather than relying on loans, which can be difficult uh, to impose their own burdens. Um, <clears throat> uh, small business incubators um, that we have around the country operating in disadvantaged communities um, could be linked to this kind of an approach to provide post-incarceration technical assistance and support um, for, um, for uh, uh, people who are returning from prison who want to start their own businesses. So those are a few of the thoughts um, that I had uh, about uh, sort of the previous work that we've been engaged, with, engaged in around personal agency and then how that might be linked to this idea of entrepreneurship. And so finally, but certainly not least, we have uh, Mark Sch 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 Schniller, um, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, who is the executive director of the Justice Policy Institute. Um, he is a dedicated justice reformer um, who has served in a variety of roles. More recently, he was a partner at a DC-based nonprofit philanthropic, philanthropic investment organization, Venture Philanthropy Partners. He served in a variety of leadership roles at DC's Juvenile Justice Agency, the Department of Youth and Rehab Services, otherwise known as DYRS, um, including Chief of Staff and, and the Interim Director. Um, he has also served as staff attorney with the Youth Law Center advocating for the rights of young people in the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Schnilder. It's okay, thank, thank you, Rod. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm a reformed lawyer, uh, but I'm glad to be with all of you this morning and uh, really appreciate uh, the Kaufman Foundation uh, organizing and, and Rashawn Ray and Brookings and the University of Maryland for convening this this discussion, which I think has just been really terrific uh, all morning. And I'm, I'm happy and honored to participate today. Um, you know, when I think back to, I really appreciated the way uh, Professor Ray uh, sort of set the context at the beginning and also Dr. Henderson at the beginning of this panel, um, you know, in terms of where we are right now, uh, you know, through a combination of just extraordinarily high incarceration rates um, to you know, what has led us now to unprecedented uh, rates of mass incarceration uh, in the US. Um, and, and the fact that um, if, if people are even employed upon release that they are more often in, in low wage jobs uh, resulted in, in what I would describe really as a practical and, and moral crisis uh, that we really need to address. This is a, clearly a crisis that disproportionately hits communities of color, particularly the African-American community. And, and core to this crisis, as we've heard you know, throughout the discussion this morning, are these very significant barriers that exist related to the impact of criminal records and, and, and race uh, on, these, on these issues. We heard from uh, Dr. Ugin earlier and, and others that the data is incontrovertible. Um, and it really makes return to the community for formerly incarcerated people uh, extremely challenging and, and has been referenced. Uh, these significant challenges exist in the best of times, but in the context that we're in now of a pandemic, uh, the challenges are, are even greater. You know, prior to COVID-19, the unemployment rate for formerly incarcerated individuals uh, was, was over 27 percent. 
a disproportionately higher rate for black men and black women uh, at 35% and 43% respectively. Those are, you know, uh, horrific rates of unemployment. Um, but, but as we know, most people who go to prison or jail eventually will be released to reenter society. And, and many, many returning citizens come back to impoverished communities that are really not equipped to provide the resources and services uh, that they and their families need to transition smoothly. And so one of the most important needs for those re-entering is securing a job. Um, but we know, and we've heard this morning that these legal and practical barriers uh, that routinely prevent them from accessing employment to earn a living wage, not just a, a wage, but a living wage uh, and, and to move out of or avoid uh, poverty. Um, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. There is there is a little good news here. Uh, I think we're starting to realize our, our mistakes as a society. We're recognizing these issues and the challenges that, that come from them. And, and we now do have, in, in recent years, really bipartisan support at the federal and state levels uh, for second chance type approaches. Uh, Professor Ray talked about that right at the outset. Um, and and a part of this approach, and it's been discussed this this morning is uh, the, the recognition that entrepreneurship is emerging as a viable alternative to traditional employment. Uh, and, and that's true for disadvantaged and marginalized individuals all over the world, including those reentering society from prison or jail. And I think as we heard from, from some of the speakers, um, this entrepreneurial thinking is because it's infused with a philosophy of empowerment that even exposure to entrepreneurial training, which I think Dr. Goger was talking about, can also just reshape the perspective of those reentering society in very positive ways. And that training in entrepreneurial skills and approaches can improve performance uh, as employees in, in, in traditional jobs uh, and also uh, potentially for entrepreneurial experiences. Um, if people returning from, from prison pursued entrepreneurship and were able to do so successfully, it would, I think, undoubtedly make a significant impact. Uh, right now, between one and 7% of people leaving, uh, if, if those people leaving state or federal prison next year started their own businesses. And I, I cite those numbers because that's the percentage of welfare to work participants who start businesses in addition to or increasing secure traditional employment. So if we had the incarcerated population doing that at the same rate as we have uh, studies showing the welfare to work uh, population, we would have as many as 45,000 uh, new businesses being created in the United States. And that's, that's significant and, and important. Um, within that, that context, I wanna just mention a few policy priorities and, and really look forward to the, to the discussion uh, that we'll get into. Um, and some things that we should think about pursuing. Uh, some of these policies should absolutely be focused on entrepreneurship. Um, we've heard some speakers talk about that, but we also need to be really mindful uh, of the real and very challenging barriers that returning citizens face in the, in the areas of housing, access to mental health and substance abuse services. Uh, and accessing public assistance in a range of areas, including for education, and we're seeing some, some progress in that. These are, these are basic needs that are often critical for returning citizens to even have a chance at becoming successful entrepreneurs. Um, so the good news, again, we've got some broad bipartisan support to, uh, to improving reentry. Uh, that's been true for the past three ish federal administrations and across uh, several Congresses. Um, and so moving forward to ensure that individuals returning from incarceration have access to all the resources and tools required, uh, we really need the current administration and Congress to make an increased uh, public commitment to reentry. And, and that is true at the state and local level as well. Um, the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration and, and their policy platform uh, does address this, I think, in, in quite good ways. And, and now we need the, need the follow through. So for example, at the executive branch level, you know, you, a lot of people talk about when you come back to the community, if, if you don't have housing, it's very difficult uh, to pursue a job or pursue entrepreneurship opportunities. So we really need to make sure, for example, that HUD 
uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development that they should be immediately repealing uh, any tenant screening regulations that create additional barriers to housing for people with a criminal history. That is critically important. Um, in the area of small business and other business efforts, the Small Business Administration can take action uh, immediately to revamp their rules and policies to fully remove exclusions uh, based on criminal history. In the context of COVID, this has come up, uh, we need, they, do, they should be looking at the rules and application forms for the Paycheck Protection Program to make sure that that uh, is uh, supportive of people with criminal records and doesn't uh, discriminate. There's been mention earlier of uh, both the, the opportunity and challenges for the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act program, uh, the, the, the WIA program and, and the Reentry Employment Program. Uh, those should be expanded. Uh, they should be organized better so they're not so siloed. Um, but those are, are uh, opportunities, I think, for, for progress. Um, we've got the Second Chance Act program uh, that is in place. We need to develop federal grant opportunities um, and other reentry for other reentry programs to provide the funding directly to nonprofits, especially those led by or that significantly involve people directly impacted by the by the justice system, including particularly returning citizens. Uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities. Uh, in the nonprofit space that can be explored as well as in the, the for-profit space. Um, just a couple of things as to, to wrap up. Uh, we really need to scale up our community reentry services with new programs. Um, the, in the last Congress, the One Stop Shop Community Reentry Program Act passed the House. Uh, that should be passed by the Senate as well. That would improve long-term reentry success. Uh, really by connecting people to career pathways that can provide for long-term uh, sufficiency. So that's, that's critically important. Um, and finally, it, it, when we think about the state and city level, we have a, an example here of an approach in, in DC uh, that partners the academic, business, and nonprofit communities and government, uh, which is known as the, the PIVOT program. Uh, PIVOT I think is an example that others can look at. That's a program that was started by the Georgetown Prison and Justice Initiative um, and partners with the Georgetown uh, McDonough School of Business and critically important, the DC uh, Department of Employment Services. And essentially the way that works is that's a reentry program for people leaving the, the DC jail that focus specifically on entrepreneurial skills and placement as part of the program uh, in businesses, including small businesses that would be related to the businesses that the participants are interested in, in, in opening. Um, critically important is the Department of Employment Services uh, in Washington, DC provides a paid stipend uh, during the program, right? And so it's a paid uh, employment entrepreneurship ex experience uh, that also starts to wrap in some of the supports for basic skills. Basic skills. So I think it's an example of the types of things we should be doing more, and also is a, a terrific opportunity for a, a public-private partnership uh, that can really support people who are interested in developing these types of skills. So those are just a couple of thoughts. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to participate, and uh, really look forward to the to the conversation. Thank you so much, um, Director Schindler. I'm so sorry, Schindler. That's okay. Um, Sch Schindler or Mark is fine. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much, Director Schindler. Um, and so I to kind of kick us off, I, I guess, um, if you all had immediate reactions to some of the things that you all discussed, um, and then we can proceed with uh, a, larger, a larger discussion around some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, I think uh, when you, you know, I think uh, uh, Mark made some very powerful points in terms of helping us understand what this was all really about. I'm also reminded of Beaver Page's great work, which, which showed that uh, when uh, she sent out these uh, resumes that identified people's ethnicity and criminal history, she found that you know, whites with a criminal record 
were more likely to receive a call back than Blacks without a criminal record. So that tells me that there's some structural things that are happening here that we oftentimes overlook, even when we put the best programming in place. And so I think we need to be cognizant of the broader social dimensions that we exist within, because even when we create uh, these great opportunities, we still have a society that still begins to place barriers up in the way of many of these individuals who are deserving of an opportunity uh, to reenter society successfully. I think I saw a question about the economic development case. And, you know, to me, I think one of the things that we need to do is start thinking about how much talent we're losing because of these very, uh, you know, blanket background checks that just eliminate people and filter them out without a second look and without any attention to, you know, how much effort have they put into rebuilding their lives? How much have they uh, worked on sort of setting themselves up and creating networks and is anyone vouching for them? We're not even looking at that or employers aren't even looking at that and they're just ignoring all that talent. And so I think there's a, a huge talent pool that isn't even getting a chance to uh, show itself. And I think, you know, by not doing blanket background checks, employers can do a lot uh, to really look a little bit deeper and evaluate people differently when they're screening candidates. Um, so that they're, they're looking for other signals than just, does this person have a record? I would just echo that uh, comment um, for employers. Uh, years ago, I did some focus groups with employers to try to get a better handle on what it is that, um, you know, tell us more basically about why you are so averse to hiring people with criminal records. And, it, you know, no surprise, it's a liability problem for them. Uh, if they knowingly hire somebody with a felony record who commits a crime against an employer uh, or against another employee or a customer, they're on the hook um, for a huge, um, you know, uh, liability settlement. And it only takes one or two of those, uh, actually. They don't have to happen very often. Um, to freeze employers uh, is what we what we found, and what they told us was that um, they are looking for these other signals that you mentioned, Annalise. Of who is this person? Uh, are they connected to other community institutions? Is there anybody there backing them up in terms of helping them navigate all of their non-work related needs? And what we found was when we introduced those ideas with employers, the anxiety levels really dropped. Um, you know, uh, a, a person without context is very, very vulnerable. Um, and, and I think it's something that uh, uh, our community-based organizations can, it's a role they can really play in taking on that, um, that, that task of, uh, building context around people with criminal records to improve their employability. Um, and we need to recognize that uh, we may not agree with sort of where, how employers handle this, but it's not entirely irrational. There's some, there is a lot of fear in it, an unwarranted fear, I think, but it's not completely irrational. Um, and we need to address that, that, the rational components that we can, as well as the uh, you know, psychological, emotional um, uh, reactions um, that employers have. If, if I can just jump in on that, just to echo, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, we've talked about, so there's, you know, in some ways, the entrepreneurship piece is almost like a workaround, right, to traditional employment because of all the barriers uh, that exist uh, for people coming out of jails and prisons. Now, it, it it should be an opportunity because, you know, if people want to have their own uh, business and, and do that, that absolutely should be should be an opportunity. But we also know that a lot of people are forced into that because they can't get jobs in traditional workplaces. Um, you know, I think we're, we're all in some one way or another employers. Right. And I think about what's necessary for for my staff at the Justice Policy Institute. And there are certain supports that we provide. Um, uh, but there are certain things that we're not in a position to provide, but other 
nonprofit organizations in the community doing reentry supports uh, are in a position to provide those basic those basic supports. And so we should be thinking about how that can support uh, traditional employers so that they have employees that can come ready uh, and, and dealing with some of those other non-work issues. Because I think the experience that we've seen is that if, if people coming out of jails and prisons, as Annalise said, there's you know, so many brilliant, the, the assets that are there, we can't waste them. But they need some basic supports to be able to, you know, uh, to function effectively. That relates to housing, uh, you know, and other things. And if they can have those, they can be terrific, terrific employees. Uh, but those are the things that we really need to think about uh, so that we can create an environment where people can succeed. I think one of the issues I, I want to bring up, I think is very important, is that you know, we have to understand that we allow the criminal justice system to hijack all things relative to crime and justice in this country. What we're talking about is really a labor issue, right? And we're talking about an employment issue. And I think that we're going to have to uh, open up spaces where these other institutions can begin to uh, deal with issues that are in their domain, right? And we're, we're talking about when you look at mass incarceration, uh, the research has been clear to us that in a period of time where unemployment should have been going down, mass incarceration single-handed took it the other way. And we haven't adequately dealt with that to date. Yeah, um, and so I, I kind of want to return to something you said earlier that really st stuck with me, Dr. Henderson, which is about this idea of transforming some of these systems, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, sort of what the difference would be from transforming some of the systems that are currently in place versus maybe starting new systems or new institutions that would be um, different than what we already have? Yeah, so I, you know, I think number one, we're gonna have to have a totally different theoretical framework to begin with, right? Uh, many of the individuals who work in these systems have a social control mindset. And we're going to have to change that mindset from social control to social inclusion. And the, the, the challenge is that we don't really understand how deeply ingrained these philosophies are. So a lot of times the figureheads, they may go out and they may espouse these new theoretical concepts, but they don't actually manifest themselves down to the everyday line work. And so we have to deal with underlying philosophy in these institutions. And I think well, as a country, we need to begin to say that this is what we're going to be about, just not for a certain segment of the population. I, I, I completely concur um, with Howard's uh, uh, assessment there. And uh, I think that, that that's a very difficult process and it requires leadership um, within these institutions. I think it needs leadership that starts with governors who have a different vision of what the correction system ought to be um, and that can take innovative ideas uh, and provide you know, uh, the kind of direction that the heads of their departments of correction, that their wardens, that their other staff uh, within these institutions um, will follow. Uh, and I think that needs to be, we need to build the models because they actually, I don't think they exist right now for change, for that. We talk about changing the mindsets of people in prison. One of the mindsets that's most in need of change are the people who run the prisons. Uh, and uh, this idea of developing agency uh, and regarding um, uh, the humanity of the people who are incarcerated uh, as a vital asset for everyone, you know, uh, that requires a lot of persuasion, leadership, training, and we need to be able to develop that so that it can be used by other institutions. Uh, because I don't, I honestly don't believe that we've got enough uh, of the models we need to do that. I, I think. This is a great question. And one of the things um, that I would like to highlight is the emergence of some new technologies and both some of the, the good things that we could, or opportunities from that, but also some of the dangers. And so um, 
so one of the things is, you know, we have this new, this first step act um, and it has, and, and also at the state level, many changes to, you know, for example, um, marijuana convictions not being illegal anymore, but it's actually taken many states and municipalities um, a lot of time to actually expunge those records. So we have uh, groups like Code for America that has developed tools to help people expunge their record, help municipalities expunge records that are no longer illegal. I think we need to figure out how to scale that kind of thing to actually implement the things that have already been achieved legislatively. Um, another technology opportunity, I think, especially as COVID has made a lot of technologies uh, for learning and training more ubiquitous. And the fact that we now allow um, Pell Grant eligibility um, for people who are incarcerated is to use online trainings, but also virtual reality uh, to provide things like scenarios for people to, for example, like practice interviewing or practice interactions where they're gonna have to, um, they're likely to encounter what, when they re-enter to try to help coach them on, on um, some skills that they could develop in that job search or in just navigating various obstacles that are really common. Uh, Rayshawn and I have been trying to start a project to build some curricula around virtual reality training and figuring out how to scale that uh, at a national level. Um, and then, but as far as some of the dangers go, I think that um, one of the things that is concerning to me are the use of artificial intelligence within background check and, and other sort of um, relation or sort of uh, reputational checking platforms. Um, there's really, it's just a wild, wild west. And I'm concerned about, um, especially for people who have conviction records, but also people who are coming from underrepresented groups, you know, to what extent are these artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies biased against these populations and how are they rating people? We have no regulatory infrastructure for these um, platforms and, you know, they might prevent, present some opportunities for looking at some other, um, you know, aspects of someone's background that could be helpful, but they could also be really dangerous. I think we need to think about how to govern that, that world. Thank you. Um, Dr. or Director Schindler, if you want to give any remarks, because um, I believe this is the last question where we have to close out. Well, I, I, I'll just go back to some of the things that Dr. Henderson and, and Brett were saying, you know, I think we really need to think about a reimagining. So, uh, you know, traditionally and today, you know, prison agencies around the country are called Department of Corrections, but they do very little in, in the way of sort of corrections and rehabilitation. And so we need to, to really think uh, seriously about uh, a different mindset as Dr. Henderson talked about. It's, it's not lost on me that I think here in, for example, in the district, uh, our local correction system is making uh, significant he headway in terms of uh, programming in the, in the facility. Uh, and the current director of the DOC does not have a corrections background. He has an education background. Right, and so he comes at it from the perspective of of a teacher, uh, not as someone who has uh, spent a, a career uh, thinking about just suppression and safety and security. Those are, you know, safety and security is important within a correctional uh, environment because you can't have treatment and rehabilitation unless people are safe. Uh, so, so I don't want to be dismissive of that, but we need uh, the vision at the top of these agencies that is about uh, education and preparing people uh, to, to be productive members of society. That of course was the original purpose, uh, but we've gotten so far away from that. Uh, and, and you know, the last thing I'll say on this is that the reality is if our jails and prisons were filled with people who look like me and my children, uh, I don't think we'd be having this, this discussion because then it would be about rehabilitation and treatment. Uh, but because we're in this historical context and we have our jails and prisons filled with people who are disproportionately black and brown, uh, it's, it, it's the way it is and it's allowed to be. And we have to, we have to break through this. This is uh, a social justice issue as much as anything else uh, when we think about the, you know, what's necessary. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, even though we could probably spend hours talking about all of these issues. Um, and so now I'll kick it back to Dr. Rashawn Ray, who's gonna give us some concluding remarks. Thank you, Rod. That was a 
phenomenal uh, panel indeed. The entire day today has simply been, been pretty extraordinary in terms of what we've seen and what's been going on in terms of the content that's been discussed from the first panel with the presentations to the second panel. I mean, look, oftentimes people look at returning citizens like they've seen on that second panel and they think, oh, if everyone was like them, things would be great. Well, one thing that I hope people heard and what they were saying is that most people are like them and they need to be given certain opportunities. The third panel started to talk about the First Step Act, which was a bipartisan legislation that brought together Republicans and Democrats to have a discussion about criminal justice reform. Moving forward, uh, Brookings and AEI uh, will be working together uh, with the support of other entities. And we appreciate the Kauffman Foundation for providing space today. And now we'll take what we've heard and be able to write it up and be able to say, hey, here are some of the best practices. These are the sort of things that are working. Here are where the gaps exist. And even though people on different parts of the political aisle might not agree about everything, but here are some things that people do agree on that definitely work so that we can ensure that the individuals like who were on that second panel, including Anthony Belton, um, including, um, including Terrell, including Brian Kelly, I mean, including the individuals who we were able to hear from are able to actually be able to actualize the American dream as much as possible. So we sincerely appreciate the Coffin Foundation for this time. This has just been an exhilarating conversation all day. And I look forward to continuing to read the work of the people who were on the panel and others. So I wanna bring up Anya to uh, close us out, to discuss what some of the other things that, uh, that will be going on at Kaufman and next steps from here. So thank you, Anya. Thank you, Yuri Sean. I really appreciate and echo all of your statements just now. Um, thank you to all of our attendees and presenters. We are so grateful for your time and insights today. Um, this forum has been recorded and we are going to share the video in the future. And we got your contact information, so we'll send out an email with when that's available. I also want to take this moment as an opportunity to announce our next forum scheduled for March 25th. Um, the topic is business incentives. What do they mean for entrepreneurship? Uh, the registration link should be in the chat. Um, we will also be sharing more information about the upcoming forum and all other activities and events that we have going on in our Insights to Entrepreneurship newsletter. And you can find the link to where you can sign up for it in the chat as well. So we hope you will join us in our future forums and events. And thank you all again and have a great rest of your day.